Welcome to the Friday Nightmares episode 27, Pets Part 2, Exotics. I am one half of your hosting team coming to you from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. That's right, Canada. Because I live in Canada, <laughs> like Scott, who wants to be George Creek, Michigan to Canada. Heather Powell. And with me, as always, is... Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from a Sports Creek, Ontario, Michigan, <laughs> Canada, USA. USA, North America, continent. <laughs> Whole new address that you just are going to make up. <laughs> be great. That's, that's how powerful I am, Heather. I just, I can just blink of an eye and move a whole state over into a new country. How do you feel about bagged milk? Because apparently for some other Americans we know, this is a big issue. I have no issue with it, though I am kind of curious uh, why bagged milk? Was there a reason for that? I have no fucking idea why it's bagged milk. Like, I know a lot. <laughs> well, you're I'm, Canadian. You should know these know. things. I have no idea why it's bagged milk. Probably because it's easier to transport, maybe. Because um, you can buy three bags and in total equal four liters of milk. Um, usually the cost is anywhere between four ninety nine to seven ninety nine, depending if you buy like, you know, um, lactose intolerant milk or Wait, whatever it is. Is that per bag? No, no, that's for all of them. Oh, okay, I was gonna say because uh, usually a gallon of milk for me because that equals up to about four liters, and a gallon of milk is about two fifty. Yeah, shut the fuck up, Scott. <laughs> Our better. That's why it costs more. That's, we'll we'll see about that when I come there to visit one day. You'll come and you'll be like, oh shit, this food is better. I'm like, I know. <laughs> why are the portions like snack size? You're gonna be like, gosh, why is there? Why can't I taste salt in my food? <laughs> <laughs> How come my blood pressure is going down while I'm here? So weird. Why why is there so many fresh fruits and vegetables everywhere? I'm so confused. <laughs> um, but speaking of processed i just ate well scott knows i i am celiac so i just went to this gluten-free bakery and i got this cookie and fuck it was full of sugar like it was just and i just ate it and i'm drinking starbucks and today in my starbucks i have um a coffee that has um like four pumps of caramel syrup in it oh boy so actually no i think this is actually the wrong drink oh Oh, no, I'm drinking someone else's drink. All right, Scott, start talking. I'll be right back. Cover the dead air. This is your All right. Scott, you got this. Talk oh about 2020 movies that you've been on. Hold on. I'll be back. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, you can see how professional we are here today on the Friday Nightmares podcast. But, yeah, unlike Heather having her super sugary food and drink, I'm just drinking myself a very large unsweetened iced tea because that's my coffee and that's how I roll. But anyways, enough about that bullshit. I guess we can kind of just, uh... Did you just sit there in silence? No, I actually was talking, and then I froze up because I didn't know where else to go with it. What did you say? I was basically just saying, well, unlike Heather and her sugary substances, I'm drinking a unsweetened iced tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that was like, oh, man. I panicked. Anyway, now I got my caramel coffee. <laughs> with like, anyway... And like the sugar from Starbucks is super intense. Like my poor dog, he thought it was like party party time. So now I was like, what's going on? What are you, what are you doing? But um, yeah, it's delicious. And we're recording Saturday afternoon, which is different for us. Um, usually we do Sunday nights. I don't know. Usually we do whenever we're free. Who the fuck are we? <laughs> Scott and I will be like, hey, if you like recording in an hour. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, we try to do it on Sunday nights just because it makes it easier because of our schedules. But sometimes, you know, there's something that happens that we just got to kind of flip it around and do it. On like a Super day. Bowl is what's happening for me. Um, and me too. Yeah, Scott's a huge fucking Super Bowl fan. He's always like, man, I can't wait to go watch me some football. I just can't wait to watch the Lions in the Super Bowl. It's going to be awesome. You know, don't stop believing, Scott. Um I was watching the Raptors beat the Nets last night, which was beyond shocking for anyone who is a Raptors fan. I did not see that coming. Yeah, and I was going to say, and that's uh, because they Raptors did good. What was it last year or the year before when they were state uh, well, yeah, champions? State champions. NBA champions. champions. Fucking like, American. Sorry. Shit. 
Fuck. <laughs> anyway, um, here's yeah. me trying to talk sports. This I know, is what right? The states and the pocky and the pucky and the and the and the touchdown and the running and the and the thingy and the shooting hoops and the shooting hoops. You just yellow term. You're like shooting hoops. <laughs> just remember, Scott, talking to anyone about sports, you say this. We need to work on our D, and we just need to score. I know. I need. I always need to work on my D. <laughs> Working on that. <laughs> Man, um, I, was, I guess I got an embarrassing uh, sports story to tell. <laughs> like, oh, uh, do you? Ooh. Well, it was. Uh, I went to the Tigers game. It was like my first ever live event going to a Tigers game with my company, and I went there, and they were playing against the uh, Red Sox, and. I'm like sitting there, I'm like watching them, I'm like, okay, this is fun. And I'm like actually getting into the game and I'm like cheering and everything. And I started cheering because like we got a home run and then realized I'm cheering for the wrong damn team because the Red Sox and the Detroit Tigers were both wearing like very <laughs> similar like, gray uniforms. Go Red Sox! <laughs> like I started cheering and everybody at my work just kind of did that quickly. Like, look over at me like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what? What did I do? That's a rock team. Oh, whoops. It's <laughs> too funny. You're so not a sports person. I love it. But that's okay. You don't need to be a sports person. You just need to be you. That's all you need to be. It's true. And I do have to say, I do love going to live events, though. They are just a lot of fun. They are fun. Um, it does help if you know what's going on, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I say. Baseball, I definitely know more of what's going on when things happen in the game. I just got confused by the teams because of the similar uniforms because, yeah, normally the Red Sox have a white with red style uniform. And this one was like a gray and red. Yeah, you just been drinking since noon. That's probably why you got confused. I, I mean, it didn't help, especially when you got free drinks from the company. Oh, man. No company would give me free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, she's going to put us out of business. <laughs> like, somebody stop her in her drink. <laughs> but horror wise, um, movie theaters are still closed here. So <laughs> we haven't got to see wrong turn. These motherfuckers. Yeah, Tim Davis, I'm fucking talking to you out in Australia. <laughs> got to see the wrong, like, not that I think the wrong turn movie is going to be like, you know, good. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I like the opportunity to go and see it. Yeah, I'll say like cuz they like theaters are open here, but I actually looked and uh really nothing that I haven't already seen. Though I have to say I was pretty impressed to see this on the uh showtimes, but uh what was it the pretty young woman or promising young woman? Promising was, young uh, woman. Pretty young woman. <laughs> yeah, promising young woman. Say, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go down that road. We don't want to go down that road. There's trouble down that road. <laughs> but yeah, Promising Young Woman was actually showing at the theater. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Because that movie was fantastic. The movie was excellent. Um, so you're saying that Wrong Turn, that that Academy Award winning film is not being showed at theaters near you? No, not yet. Give it time. Maybe they'll realize the like mistake. The theaters will realize the mistake of you know not airing this wonderful Oscar-worthy <laughs> film. And then... <laughs> because everyone's like oh wrong turn but you know what i still want to see it i Same still here. i still want to check it out so i'm just fucking jealous of anyone that gets to go to the theaters there's some I mean, other theatrical releases that have come out anyway too right uh i think so like not really much in the horror genre it doesn't look like at least once again from my theaters but uh i will have to say like that wrong turn remake it's gotta be better than most of the sequels you know, the sequels are pretty painful. I didn't mind, which one was it? The third one, but I've only seen one, two, one, two, three. Yep, that's same, same as me. Like, part two was ridiculous, had some good kills. Part three was just a much more serious story and actually, like, actually was a good story. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I, yeah, we'll see, right? Like, I don't know. I'm looking forward to checking it out. I just hope the theaters are open by the time Candyman comes out. Yeah. I, you have some funny things to say about St. Maud later in theaters. I really want to hear you say it on air because I think it's really funny. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's a slow beginning of the year. I just saw that uh, Shudder um, announced that Joe Bob's going to do a Valentine's Day special. Yep, with actually, and it seems like one of the clues to one of the movies, he's getting one of the stars from this film on the show. So it's kind of a hint of one of the movies he'll be covering. And I believe it is the Love Witch, which was either my number one or number two when it came out a couple years ago. It was like a, it's very just kind Love, of. Is it Lovecraft? No, it's pretty much about a woman that is uh, obsessed with being loved and having a hard time finding someone that will love her. So she starts using love spells on men and the love spells backfire on her. 
and uh, they just like the men just become obsessed with her to the, too too much to the point where she ends up having to kill him. Mm. <laughs> and, it's like love potion number nine. Oh, yeah, and but the thing that's really cool about this film is you watch it and it looks and feels like a film from the sixties and seventies. The aesthetic and everything. It's really neat how they did it. Does it feel like a sixties or seventies Italian film? No, <laughs> um, though it is a very slow burn, like a lot of those films. There's no eyeball close-ups. Aye. No, no <laughs> eyeball close-ups in this one. <laughs> That's really funny. Well, it's, there's not really much going on. I feel like we're like, so it's been quarantined, and we watched movies again. We watched like, it, like I opened this Google. So, so Scott and I have a Google Doc sheet. So I usually set up all the notes and. I break it all down because he does all the editing and I'm like, okay, um, you add the movies you watch. Cause sometimes we watch the same 2020s, sorry, 2021s. And sometimes we don't and fucking son of a bitch. How many are on here this week? Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we're 16. one more, one more than we were last time. Like, we're not being selective, Scott. We're basically <laughs> like whoring out to all the fucking movies that are out there. And being- At the same time though, I mean, if I look at my letterbox, I think there's only like two that I really disliked completely. Yeah, but you like a lot of things. I do. You're you're a you're a sunshine, happy times person, <laughs> so, which is nice. Um, I'm I'm probably just a step below you. I don't love everything, but I don't hate things the way other people do. Like I don't get mad when I watch a movie that I think was shitty. Like I don't ever I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I to watch that movie. Like I don't. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, that was shitty, and I move on. I'm usually just going, well, this is bad. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> I don't see the point of getting upset about that. I just yeah. think there's too many other things in my life I could be upset over. <laughs> that was shitty movies that I watched. I just, for me anyway. Right, it's um, too much stress. Yeah, you know, I just want to, I just want to live in a world of no stress and relaxation and living my best life um that was too funny that i made you talk by yourself there that was really funny i hope you leave that in of you like trying to make awkward conversation (laughs) yeah i'll cut out a bit of i'll cut a bit of the silence out so it's not just sitting there for too long but like you just kind of left put me on the spot right there i know i totally did can you imagine that have been our first like three episodes you would have been like oh man i don't know (laughs) i'd be like i quit (laughs) <laughs> yeah, especially because those first the first two episodes were recorded in person, and yeah, you'd be like, "All right, I'll be back, Scott," and you just leave. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't Which... like changes, and it's great because you're so sweet about details. So, like Scott and I played. So, quick side story. So, Scott played trivia with. Well, okay, so there's an online trivia that happens in Hamilton, Ontario. And I said to Scott, you know, I know you're free Wednesday night. Do you want to play? He's like, yeah, sure. So I sent him the link and like, he's so detailed. I'm like, yeah, here's the link. He's like, so how does this work? I'm like, ah, you just like open the same link. And then <laughs> like no instructions, no guidelines. And Scott's like, so you want to tell me how this thing's going to go down? I'm like, <laughs> just open the link. <laughs> You can tell how we both function. <laughs> yep. like, you can tell. How like I will of us look to I, I will give you like step by step instructions. Okay, you gotta do this, then you gotta yeah. do this, and then you yeah. gotta do this. And Heather's just going, oh, I'm just gonna throw you to the wolves. <laughs> yeah, like open the link, Scott. What's the fucking problem? <laughs> but you figured it out and we played yeah, it wasn't trivia, too hard. And that was a lot of fun. Are you gonna play this week? Uh, yeah, so as uh, long as I'm not doing anything, which, hmm, shocking, I probably won't be. <laughs> <laughs> if all the mad bitches aren't calling, then he'll be around. Hmm, let's listen for those calls. <laughs> hmm. Cricket. Cricket. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. And and Scott started working out this week. I was I wondering when you know that he's already a smoke show and he's gonna up that smoke showness to I don't know, a billion. I'm gonna be a fireball. Fireball. The pitbull's <laughs> gonna play randomly every time he walks into the room. It's <laughs> running 905 or 305. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. All right, we should get into these fucking 16, 20, fucking 21 movies. This is what happens when you go rogue and you start watching stuff on your own, Heather. Jeez. Who watches 16? Like, we're not even in February. We're at February 6th. And we somehow he's watched like an insane amount of 2021 movies. Yeah, because the funny thing is, I'm already, it's yeah, February 6th, and I'm already at 37 2021 movies. You know, I feel like we saw Mark Nato and was like, Mark Nato, we will be you. 
we are coming for you, but we will always be behind you because there's no way we'll actually catch up well, to you. Well, and he watches everything. Like, there was one yeah. film he watched, and I don't – yeah, we'll talk about it. I have no idea how he got through it because um, it was – it was like someone took a camcorder and recorded shit with their friends. So I'm just looking up on my letterbox to talk about the next one, the first one on here, which is Dark Whispers. Um, did you watch this, Scotty? Yes. Okay. Um, it's an anthology film. It's a 99 minute runtime. It it is the anthologies are directed by multiple directors. It is stated as volume one, so one would assume um, <laughs> additional ones are going to be assume. coming out. Assume that different ones are going to be coming out. Uh, basically, it starts off the wraparound. I'll give a little bit of a synopsis. A, a young woman comes home to her decreased mother's house and finds a book in which she cannot stop reading. And then she's told she can't stop reading or something will happen. So it's given a 3.1 rating on the letterbox, uh, probably because a handful of people have watched it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you and I, <laughs> that'd be about it. <laughs> Scott and I and Mark Mato have watched it. Uh, Scotty, what were your thoughts? Um, this one is already like starting to fade from my memory. I know, like, right? I'm like, ah. <laughs> like all I remember for the the main part was the wraparound, and I do remember the stories were not bad and were more real life style horror. Yes, it it was definitely along the lines of Im- immortal. Yes, from last year, except um, just not as Im- not as good. Were not impactful. <laughs> yeah, not as good though. Don't don't think it's gonna be as good. Um, it's not bad. I like anthologies. It's actually really hard for me to dislike. I, I didn't put it on here because you talked about it, but I watched that hundred candle one and I enjoyed that one too. Um, I realized I really like anthologies. I, I yeah. really enjoy short stories. So, you know, if you really like anthologies, I think you will enjoy dark whispers. The stories are decent. The special effects are decent. The acting is decent. Um, there's some very clear moral messages to some of the stories. I think one that really stands out is about a mermaid. Oh, um, yes, yes. Okay, very, you mentioned that. that brought, now, now it's coming back to me. Very, very, very well done story. Um, yeah, with a, uh, yeah, with a dark twist to it. Very dark twist. So, you know, if you like anthologies, I think it's worth a watch. Currently, it's not available anywhere, but it will be eventually available on the Google, the iTunes, the YouTube, when it has a release date. Um, yeah, you like anthologies, give it a shot. Yep, I completely agree. It's it's least worth a watch. It will not break anybody's top 10, I would be, I would assume, but it's still worth checking out because, yeah, it's definitely a uh, decent anthology because like and you know with most anthology horror films there's going to be some good stories and some bad stories very rarely is all are all stories really good but yeah that's the that's the fun about anthologies i think i think if you are truly an anthology fan watch this if you could care less like if an if an anthology really needs to knock you off your feet for you to dig it skip this one like if mortuary collection to you was the only anthology that you enjoyed last year do not bother watching dark whispers because you're not going to enjoy it if you enjoyed scare package um immortal there was another anthology that came out there was one that was done by women directors that came out last year um and actually i think this one right here dark whispers is all women directors is it i didn't look at all the director names um i think if you you know enjoy that then check it out but if mortuary collection was your uh your go-to then i would say skip this bad boy because i don't think it's going to be your jam yeah i agree and uh, looks like the next two on the list are you. Yeah, I'm gonna. I was gonna just keep rolling, rolling, rolling. What? <laughs> rolling, <laughs> yeah, I rolling. Know. Anyway, I know y'all be loving this shit Who's right, right here. here. <laughs> so the next one on here is Caged. It's uh, an 81 minute film. It follows an African American male who is imprisoned and placed in solitary confinement. Um, this movie had Heather written all over it. Um, false, guilty. Um, or in prison for a crime that he may or may not have committed. You're, you're not really quite sure as it goes on. Uh, treated like garbage from the, from the, from the jail um, guards. You know, it, it was a political movie. This was a political movie about incarceration, incarceration and what it does to people. The acting was out of its world good, but it didn't hook me. Um, I don't know if it just didn't, 
Um, the message just didn't reach me as much as it could have, but I really didn't buy it. And I think it could have been done a little better. It is low budget, but they do use their budget well. The acting from the main male lead is phenomenal. You will recognize um, Angela Ser Serafine. Serafine. She was she played. Um, she was in the Hulu's Into the Dark, um, the Christmas one that came out last year. Oh, okay. Uh, the Puka Lives? Not Puka Lives. The one where they all have to go to the boss's family's house and... Oh, oh, uh, crap. I can't remember the name of that one. The but one... Yeah, I know you know, with Julian right. Sands. Yeah, and, and like they have to play those stupid games and stuff. So you, you'll you recognize her from being in that. Um, the main actor definitely has a long history. He's been in X-Men, Twilight, uh, Gone Baby Gone, Cranked, a uh, lot of different side films. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of dancing around this because obviously you can't give too many things away. It's a, you know, you know, the premise walking into it and that's fine. I will say that this actor does very good at giving monologues and, and acting kind of with him, with himself, without a lot of other actors in the room. And that's but, always impressive. Yeah, it is impressive. But I think you really got to be really into political movies for this one, because I think the most average person will find it boring unless you really have a big political eye and that's something that you're really into. The horror is not super strong in it. It's it's almost like a thriller mystery um, for some people. I don't think a lot of people would find it a horror at all. But if you're interested in watching, it's on YouTube, Vudu, YouTube, Microsoft Store, and DirecTV. It's available. And I think if you're interested in the stuff I talked about, it's worth the rental price. Nice. So... One that is not worth anything, <laughs> and I recommend not watching, even though it has a 2.7 star rating on Letterbox. which, you know what, I, I will give a, a caveat for maybe people who may like this, is The Village in the Woods. Um, this is a British film. It is an 82-minute runtime, and fuck, it felt like it was a 192-minute runtime. Um, it's, it's a movie about a couple that uh, inherits a, a house, and they go out there and they, you know, the, the place is not what it seems and the neighbors are not what they seem. And chaos goes from there. It's very, very low budget. Um, the acting is all right. It really does drag it out. Like you got to be really into like going out somewhere and not knowing what people are going to be like there and having to deal with the circumstances that occur around you. Uh oh! It has to be one of those. It's it's a slow burn, and the eighty-two minute runtime feels like, as I said, a hundred and ninety-two minute runtime. So, uh, but if that is your thing, maybe other people will like this. As I said, it does have a two point seven rating on Letterbox, though I am the only one that has watched it that I know out of all my contacts here. So who knows? Um, maybe as more people watch it, we'll get a better idea of how good it is. It is on Amazon Prime, YouTube, Vudu. Google, uh, YouTube, Voodoo, Google Play, and a Microsoft Store, if you're interested. I personally wouldn't rent it, personally. I don't think it's worth it at all. Yeah, but. And I'm, I'll take your word on that one, because, yeah, I've I, I seen the trailer, and I'm going, oh, this looks like it could be good, and then you were telling me, like, yeah, okay, okay nah, nah. I don't think mind. you will enjoy it. I would say to you, don't waste your time. Yeah, I'm not going to bother. Yeah. Uh, but I will give you a short little reprieve and jump on the next one, then, since we both watched this. So the next movie we're going to talk about is Ro, also known as Soul, which I believe was an Indonesian horror film, but the synopsis plays out as cut off from civilization, a single mother puts her children on high alert when they bring home a young girl caked in clay. She tells of spirits and spirit hunters, but these are not mere superstitions. As more sh strangers show up on her doorstep, she quickly finds another reason to fear the forest. Now, this is one that I was very curious about because I'd seen the uh, trailer and heard about the snap or read the synopsis about this, I think sometime last year. And uh, yeah, this was uh, one that I kind of want to rewatch at some point, like before the end of the year, because it may go higher on my list because there's a lot going on in this film. Mm. And there is a lot of just messed up shit that happens too. like there is some very like just violent, gruesome scenes in this. But it's it is one of those films where, yeah, it's, it's going to definitely unsettle some people for sure. Yeah, I I probably didn't like it as much as you did. But I did think there were some parts in it that were very creepy. What I do like about Indonesian films, because I have seen a couple now, is I do like their subtlety with horror. I like how they use 
not a lot of special effects to make things creepy. They just have yes. people walking in the background or things um, giving you that uneasy feeling. And I think that really plays on a more realistic side of, of horror that I very much appreciate instead of over the top theatrics that you can sometimes get in North American films. Yep, um, completely agree. Because yeah, like I've noticed with a lot of these like Eastern countries, especially like we get a lot of that type of filmmaking style. Yeah, and I do admire that quite a bit. I think this film is solid. I would definitely recommend it to people. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Yeah, I this really is one don't. I could yeah, say because this is one that I could see if it's watched by the certain people, they will probably have it in their top ten by the end of the year. Um, so I think I'm going to probably say in Pedagor. In Pedagor. Yes. Bottom line is, if you like that film, you will probably like this. Yes. Um, so I would say to you, watch it if that was your jam from last year. If you had that on your top 10, top 20, even top 30 list, depending on how many films you watched, I think you will definitely enjoy this movie. It's not available yet for rental, but it will probably come out to all the same places that we see all the time. So Microsoft Store, YouTube, Google Play, uh, when it has an official release, uh, we got to watch a screener, insert hair flip here. So <laughs> that's why we have seen it. But yeah, definitely recommend checking it out. I think uh, you will not be disappointed. Yep. Who knows, maybe Shutter might even pick this one up this does look like something that could end up on shutter yeah i could really see shutter grabbing this one and at an 82 minute runtime yet again it doesn't overstay its welcome i really appreciate these films that get to the point especially in horror you know you got to be a really special film to go longer than 82 minutes in my opinion or or 90 like you really have to do something unique um personally yeah because uh there are as long as the story is good and you can keep the keep the audience's attention, then you can deserve a longer runtime. But like, I, there's been some films that I've seen uh, this year so far that have not like they have gone way too long and have like basically used a lot of scenes as filler. And when you're doing that, you are losing my interest fast. Yeah, it's yeah, I agree. So I guess we'll move on to the next one because it's also an international film. Yep, and it's the, the only one that you've seen. Yes, yes. It's the only film I watch. Scott, oh, or, watched. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, you're Scott's the only one. watched watch all it. these. I watch nothing. Yeah, I mean, you are the only one to watch this one. Is how I've been I know. It. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> I'm just a bully. That's so all. mean. I am. I'm a bully. It's true. So, Diva, which is, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say this is a South Korean film. I believe it's a South Korean film. Um, and if you've seen Black Swan, if you've seen The Perfection, and if you've seen that, um, the one that was released on Prime last year. Oh, uh, Nightingale. Or not Nightingale, uh, Nocturnal. Nocturne. Um, you've seen this film. <laughs> so, only it's at a pool and about synchronized diving. So it's it's very well done. I think if you are a fan of Asian horror, this is definitely in your, your must-watch list. Uh, the acting is very good. The story is very good. I was interested in the entire story, but it is definitely something we've seen before. So if you are tired of that storyline and you don't care, then I would say skip this. If you are a lover of that storyline and a big fan of Asian cinema, I think you will enjoy this film. At an 84-minute runtime, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It gets to the point very quickly. As I said, it's a very, very well-done film. I just don't think this is going to be a film for everyone because I think the plot point has been redone a lot recently. Yeah. Um, and I think some people may grow tired of it, but... Well done film. It has not been officially released yet, but yet again, will be released on the usual uh, YouTube, Google Play, Microsoft Store. Possibly this is something Netflix may pick up. I don't think it's, I don't think it's dark enough for Shudder, to be honest with you. I think Soul will be more likely to be pushed, picked up than Diva will. Um, yeah, but I that's see just that. my my personal opinion. I think eventually it may end up on because Netflix does a lot of international, specifically Asian and South Asian horror. So I think we could see that on Netflix eventually. Yeah, because this is one that I've seen the trailer for, and I definitely want to watch because I do. I am not tired of that storyline yet of like the Black Swans and all that. Like I do enjoy those, especially if they're done right. Yeah. And this one looked like it could be done right. So I was very curious. I'm and glad that's really not a spoiler. Like the moment you start watching the film, it becomes very clear in the first five minutes of what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, does it have the same ending as all those? Well, you'd have to watch to see what happens. Um, I can definitely say 
that it was a different spin, but it's all the same. Like, it's like zombie films. If you're tired of zombie films, you know, there may be some zombie films that, like, do a little bit of a twist to it, but it's still a zombie film. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> you got to kind of make your call there on how you feel. So the next one, though, I really feel like Scott should talk about because um, he just loves it so much. And I just feel <laughs> like it really brings some some real clarity to how much he enjoyed this film. All right. So I may get a little... uh hate for this one we'll see what happens like when when it's officially released which by the time you guys hear this should be out by the time the episode is released but uh that movie is saint maud having recently found god self-effacing young nurse maud arrives at a plush home to care for amanda a hedonistic dancer left frail from a chronic illness when a chance encounter with a former colleague throws up hints of a dark past it becomes clear there is more to sweet maud than meets the eye and this is one of those films that, I'm, if I remember correctly, early on in our episodes when we used to talk about trailers, we were both like talking about, oh, this looks like it could be pretty good. I, I was, think you wanted to see it more than I did. Yes. I was just yeah. going to say, I think I was more yeah. excited about it. Yeah. I was like, A24 hasn't really done me wrong yet. And this looks really, really good. I, I'm excited. And I watched it. A24 has done me wrong. <laughs> why did they drop this movie last year? I'm still not quite getting why they didn't drop this movie last year. Um, because A24 really loves to put their movies into theaters, even even though none of their movies ever do really well in theaters. Mm. So I think they were just trying to wait as long as they could to release it in theaters. And it just, because of the pandemic, really didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but my personal thoughts on this, it's not a bad film. It's really well done, like really well made. But this story just did not grab me at all. I was so bored during the majority of it. Um, I pretty much seen the ending coming. This is an extremely slow burn movie with a eh, payoff at the end. And, but like, I, I just can't at the same time, I can't just trash this movie because yeah, it is very, very well done, Phil. Absolutely, this, yeah. This is just one that is not for me. Uh, I and Heather wanted me to bring up my little comment about theaters. I said to her, I messaged her after watching it, going, "Boy, I am so glad I did not go to theaters and pay for this because I would have been pissed." Yeah, I think that you know, I I've kind of I fall in the same camp as Scott. I will say this movie is extremely well acted, well written. Um, I do like the two concepts that they integrate into this movie. But I personally think that the one, con I, I think they should have just gone with one or the other. I think yeah. combining two concepts were detrimental uh, for lots of different reasons. That being said, I think the relationship between two of the characters in this was very good. The acting between the two of them was very good. The writing was very good, but it is very slow. And it's a very like Debbie Downer film. It's like watching The Lodge. It's yeah. very Debbie Downer. Like, it's just Downer. It's like watching any movie that's like heredity. You know, it's just sad. Like, you just know walking yeah. into it, you're like, well, this isn't going to be a happy movie, right? So, yeah, well, I, and I and I like a lot of those Debbie Downer films, but yeah, this one just wasn't for me. Yeah, I um, I can totally see why people will like this. I imagine it will grace top tens this year yep. coming up, and that is absolutely fine. It just did not hit the mark personally for me, but very much respect for how well this film was made, the acting in it. Um, it just wasn't, and some of this is my own, and I, of course, I'm trying to stay away from. There's some personal values I had that I yeah. felt in this movie. Um, We're not portrayed correctly. Yes. And and that's my own personal thing. That's to no way say to other people, you can't enjoy this film because of my personal values. I think that's a really immature approach. So Right. And that's um, kind of the same way I feel about it too, because you and I have like pretty much similar personal values on this type of something. Yeah, right. And But a solid made movie, like definitely A24, definitely delivered that if this is your jam, you are not going to be disappointed. So... Um, I think going into this film, just know that it is a slower film and it's going to be looking at two, ma two major concepts um, and how those concepts integrate with each other. And um, yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. Yep. And uh, I will, uh, I know that this is going to be released, I believe it was February 12th. Uh, very weird where it's getting released. It is getting released on the cable channel Epics on their streaming service. Oh, interesting. Which I find very odd because not many people watch Epics. Well, they'll be able to rent it because even if things are released sometimes on Shutter, you unless it's a Shutter exclusive, you can rent it. Yeah, so um, I'll say maybe it'll be available on VOD when it comes out. But yeah, that's all I heard is 
Saint Maud coming to Epics, and I'm going, huh, that's very odd spot for it. Well, maybe they paid the most. Maybe they thought that was yeah. going to get people to subscribe to their I mean, it's network, a smart business right? move. It's yeah, a very right. Smart business move. It's a, it's you know, yet again, A24 comes up with some good films. So I think that this is worth a rental. You know, but go into it knowing that you have to enjoy those slow burn, like The Lodge, um, Black Coast Daughter kind of films that just take yeah. a while to get going and focus a lot on character development if that's your thing then you're going to really enjoy this film yep especially if uh especially if you are very religious this will probably have more of an effect on you than some others too yes it it may um now i'm not as religious as some of the other people that we know but i didn't like how religion was portrayed in this yeah. i thought it could have been portrayed, portrayed more effectively i didn't think it was portrayed offensively i just think it could have been portrayed more effectively yeah. um and i'm going to be on another show to talk about this movie so i don't want to go too yeah. much into it um, yeah, and by the time this comes out that episode should be out too so yeah but they'll both be out at the same time yeah, but, so um, I was like, yeah just give listen to that show to get the full details from heather <laughs> well and i don't even know how much spoilers we're going to give because it is oh yeah that's right right it is a new movie um i would love to be on a, an episode with people someday who really liked this film um and be able to talk about spoilers. I think I would really yes. enjoy that because I think I have just some valid points on where the concepts weren't presented well. And I'd like to hear someone's rebuttal to it, Yeah, uh, to be honest. So anyway, I'm going to let you read the next one because I always screw up this name. And I know. All you right. Do you, okay. So I'm going to get to the synopsis real quick. All right. So the next one, uh, this is a first horror film out of Tunisia. Yeah. Which Right there, I was just like, ooh, I love it when a new country, or not a new country, a country releases yeah. a new horror film like for, for their first time ever, because it's like, yeah. ooh, I wonder what they can do, what their culture mm -hmm. is going to be like, and like how that'll be integrated into the horror. Well, this film is called Dakra. Uh, the synopsis is, come for Tunisia's first horror film, following three students' filmed investigation of weird rumors in a remote village, and stay for the sickening madness, macabre witchcraft, ghastly beheadings, and gory cannibalism. <laughs> it's a kind of a strange synopsis, but I, I, it's what pulled me in originally. I'm going, ooh, okay, I'm sold, because <laughs> it sounds like almost a, uh, almost like an old school, like '60s, '70s style, like way to pull someone into a theater. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I think, I think they did this also because they wanted to set people's expectations for this film. And I think that I feel very confident in saying that I was very pleased with this film. And if this yes. is their freshman effort in a national released wide horror film or global released wide horror film, because I'm sure there's been other horror films, but perhaps this is the first one globally to go and be entered in film festivals and, and eventually make it to VOD rental across, you know, North America, for example. Um, I look forward to what's to come. Um, if this is if this is their starting point, I think this film is very long. It is 113 minutes in length. Uh, probably could have shaved some of it off, but I enjoyed the entire thing. I was invested in all of the characters. I appreciated there was one scene where they could have showed nudity and nudity, and they didn't. Yeah, and I kind of really appreciated that. I don't, I, I, I don't know how you felt about that, Scott, but I thought it was really classy for a change. Honestly, like, like you've heard me say it before, like a lot of the time nudity in films feels pointless. Like, yeah, there's no reason for it just to show nudity. And like, yeah, I thought that was very, uh, very neat to see that done on this type of, especially, you know, from a country that's probably watching North American horror films and getting ideas on how to do horror films. And like, they could have easily just, like, there could have been lots of reasons for nudity in this film and they didn't do it. And, and the culture is very conservative when it comes to, you know, stuff like that. Um, and and this scene in particular, I thought it was haunting because you didn't know where certain things were coming from. Yes. Um, and I, and I, and it could have been two different things, right? Like it, you know, and, and Scott and I are, I'm trying to be very careful to give, not give spoilers here. Um, I thought it was going to be a found footage like film. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of shocked on that, but the acting in it was good. And really there's a twist that I didn't see coming. And when they went back and they explained it, I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Like, yep. <laughs> shit like there was there was and and definitely scenes where i was like holy fuck yeah and uh this movie is based on a concept of what happens um i read a review that they're like it's not based on a true story well of course it's 
but what they're talking about is what happens there's a there's an overall problem that's occurring within the culture and it's reflecting that problem yeah um it's definitely if you like foreign films i would say it's definitely worth your time it is a little long but i do believe it is worth a rental i i think that you will be in engaged with the characters and will care what will happen to them the filming that is done is very unique at times the special effects are decent enough for what you see i think they did a pretty good job and they were smart with certain well, things I thought they... on how yeah i thought they did fantastic like yeah um i will say that yeah this film like because you were saying the run, the runtime time really didn't bother you that much like mm -hmm. for me it did drag just a little bit mm -hmm. in the middle for me where i was just kind of starting i almost grabbed my phone a few times but i was like nope not gonna do it because i'm gonna get confused on what's going on yeah and but other than that it wasn't it yet it was really fascinating just to watch this film and I have to say there were some really unsettling scenes in this. There was. And and the actors portrayed it well. I, for me, this will be on my top 20. Um, yeah. <clears> and <throat> Same here. And that's just a personal I, – I just think this film – was really good with what it worked with. I enjoyed it. Not everyone's going to feel that way. I do think it's worth a rental, especially two ninety nine, one one ninety nine. If you can, if you can rent it for that, it hasn't been had an official release yet. This may be picked up by Shutter. I do think this is good enough to be picked up by Shutter at the minimum Netflix. I do feel like Shutter is where the premium international films go, with the exception of uh, the Call, which was on um, Netflix. Netflix. Um, but I, I do think this could go to either one of those streaming services and be well received. If not, I would recommend uh, even three ninety nine rental for it. I think if you read the synopsis and it sounds like something that you would enjoy, it's it's a well done movie. Yeah, personally, I would even say five ninety nine rental. I would even oh, okay. be willing to pay. Like I like I, iTunes, I iTunes money. That's iTunes money yeah. rental. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I really really enjoyed this. It was a very nice surprise. Because yeah, I agree with everything. And you it's say. something different. I will give them credit. It was something different. I honestly haven't seen that concept, everything included, that they've done before, no. including the twist. Like, I didn't see that twist coming. Like, it was, you know, it may win for best twist of the year. Like, yeah. I really did That's not. That's a good point. I really didn't see that coming. Like, I'm glad you didn't see it coming either. I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it caught me completely off guard. Right? So, um, anyway, check it out if you guys get a chance to. We, we definitely recommend it. And have you seen this next one, or is it just me? Nope, it's just you for the next two. Okay, so the next one is Spirit, The Beginning of Fear. Now, I want to think that this is a Japanese film, but I feel like I need to make sure I check first to see where it originated from. It's very much a ghost story. I told Scott about this, and I said to him, I don't know um, if you will like this film or not, because it is very much... Oh, it is South Korean. Okay, it's a South Korean film. It is very much a slow burn. Uh, there's no real gore in this film. So I will tell all those gore hounds out there right now, there is no gore in this film. It really plays on the concept of ghosts. It really plays on the concept of evil and evils um, and how that you know portrays out to the rest of society and what happens to us when we die. It is an 80 minute runtime. It, it does feel like an 80 minute runtime. You feel every minute. Um, I really enjoy South Korean horror films. So I really enjoyed this. I enjoy subtle humor as we talked about in our opening episode of the year where I really enjoyed Pulse. Um, I really enjoyed um, the original Dark Water this just fits up my alley for me. Yeah. Um, it's a slow burn, but I find it creepy probably because of my own thing with ghosts. And I always like how quote unquote realistic ghosts look in Japanese South Korean films. So if you like that, if your name is Don and Ellie, um, <laughs> Venom, you will probably like this film. Even Derek, Derek might enjoy this film as well too. Um, for the average user, I think you really got to dig Asian ghost stories to like this film. If you're not um, an Asian ghost story and not like the Ringer the Grudge readaptation in the American version of it, I'm talking about the original. If you like those and other ones, you will probably enjoy watching this. Um, but I don't think it's going to be anything that's going to grace anybody's top 10 with the exception of maybe like people like Vin or, or Derek or, or possibly Don and Ellie, um, because of just what their tastes are. 
Yeah. And I'll say like, this is one that like, yeah, you, you don't think I might like, I, it doesn't sound like something I will like, but it's one that I, I want to watch just cause you know, maybe it is one of those films that connects with me. Cause like, yeah, it may, I, I honestly will be surprised if it does. Yeah. The, the other one, like, I actually got it confused when I was talking to you. Cause I, uh, I was thinking of the other one. Uh, I know when you die or whatever it was that. I oh, thought that we, one. Yeah, it's more of a comedy. That, yeah. Or no, that one's uh, that one's more like that one reminded me a lot of like the uh, Asian ghost stories we already covered. Yeah. Did you see it? No, I got just the trailer. So I want to. Oh, okay. like, that's what I want to go check out as well. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. I, I anyway, I enjoyed this. Um, but I with the caveat, I it's not available anywhere yet. This may be picked up by Shutter. Um, if anything, it will be available for rental on the same, you know, Google Play, iTunes, Microsoft Store. I think if you enjoy Asian films, this was worth whatever rental you'll pay for. But you really have to enjoy Asian, South Korean, Japanese, you know, all those ghost stories and that kind of legend behind that to really get into this. All right. Nice. And then the next one. <laughs> okay. I, I could not remember what movie this was. Oh, but then I, I remember now. It's a. Uh, we're paranormal investigators and we're going to a haunted house and it's haunted. Um, I thought because of plans we have for a future guest and a future show that maybe this could be a 2021 movie that we talk about. This will not be a 2021 <laughs> movie that we talk are about. You, are you sure? Um, this movie is a 93 minute runtime. It is about the paranormal investigators that go to a haunted house and it looks like it was filmed on someone's handheld camcorder. Hmm. It was like someone found my grandma and grandpa's camcorder from 1993. I was like, son of a bitch, let's make a fucking movie. <laughs> and um, it's painful. It's It's so painful that there was an acting part of one girl was so bad I had to fast forward the five minutes that she was in it. Oh, that's I, right. I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, she was just so dreadful. It was like these people played dress up and were over the top in their acting. Uh, there were some people that had some acting chops and then there was just, I think they just got their friends and everybody they know to play these minor roles and it was just it was dreadful. I don't recommend renting it. I really don't recommend watching it. Unless, I, yet again, you maybe want to make your own film one day and you want to see how, you know, you, you may be working with a limited budget and how your friends, you know, would act during the movie, then it's worth your time. If not, I don't like <laughs> father so no. what you're telling me is top 10 material top 10 material um my number one actually nothing's gonna knock it out of its place <laughs> but you know i'll give these guys credit i think it takes balls to go and make something and put it out there so props to these guys you know i i just think they should have probably kept some of their friends out of the movie and just stuck with the people that had some acting chops and it probably would have been better um, that would be my feedback. You know, stop. Don't put your friends just because you think they want to be in a movie, and they overact. It it just looks bad, and it just ruins it for the rest of the film. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I have not seen this, but I know what you mean for sure. You're, you don't you don't want to see this. It's yeah. I, I'm not gonna bother now. <laughs> no, like don't even. But but the next one we're gonna talk about. Yes. Now this one, I would say was uh, quite a surprise actually. Um, and this one can be found on Amazon Prime. And all I will say right off the bat is trust our word and not the cover art. The cover art for this looks awful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we, uh, I ended up watching a trailer and going, well, shit, this looks way better than that trailer ever gave, or that movie, the cover ever gave it credit for. Yeah. And then our good friend Brandon Orlick told us, yeah, give this, watch it. You'll be surprised. But the movie I'm talking about is The Night They Knocked. Uh, which is during the last weekend together, a group of friends staying at a reclusive mountain house have their fun suddenly interrupted by a knock at the door. And yeah, I was very impressed by this film. Like it was low budget done right. Uh, but yeah, it's like a, pretty much a home invasion film. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, but it was pretty much a home invasion film. And like it, the all the acting was pretty good. There are some characters mm -hmm. in it that are... Uh, very annoying that you just get tired of but at the same time oh really that, i didn't get too annoyed by anybody 
Um, the one guy that kept accusing the dude's brother was getting on my nerves. Oh, he was. Oh, I thought he was okay. He didn't. He didn't bug me too much. But yeah. But uh, but yeah. Then like you know, there are like the stereotypical style uh tropes, or not yep. stereotypical, but like there are the horror tropes in this that. Yeah. But at the same time, like yeah, it's an easy watch. It was pretty damn entertaining. The villains I thought were pretty freaking creepy. Um, like I did, like I expected this to be really hokey, low budget, bad. I act. feel like Beyond the Shadows should the people that made that movie should watch this movie. Yeah, because this movie, you know, they don't have a lot of money. The acting is passable. Yeah. It is, you know, there's some people that are better than others, but it's passable. And the dialogue flows where it needs to flow. You care enough about the characters. Like, I don't know. Like, it was low budget, but it was endearing. Yeah. Like, it was the weirdest thing. It was It was almost like an uncorked film. Yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Because, yeah, like, uh, especially with the character development. Like, you don't, yeah. get a lot of, you don't get a lot of good, like, great character development and, like, typical low budget. There are some, but... Like this one, like had some really good character development, especially between the two brothers. And there was one kill that was really like. There's several kills you see, but this one in particular, I thought they handled it really well. Yeah, like it has to do with a pool ball, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but man, like it, everyone delivered that scene really well. The actress. The characters around her, the the people like their her friends, like I felt like everyone nailed that scene. Like that is a scene that if you want to do special effects on a low budget, watch that fucking scene because yeah, everything absolutely what they needed to do. Yep, I completely agree. Like this was just like a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, it was. It you know, and I think yet again, when you walk into this, don't expect the fucking strangers, okay, guys? Like this is not the quality that the strangers is. It's it's not. Um, but it's not a bad movie. It really isn't. And Brandon said this business, this movie has no business being as good as it is. And he's 100% right. Yeah. Like, this isn't something that you're going to be like, oh, man, top 10 of the year. But if what, when we do our low budget awards, you better believe this will be on there for me as a movie that I would consider that worked with their low budget really well and delivered a pretty decent film. Yeah, I would say because I was entertained from beginning to end. Like, and like I was saying before, I actually cared about a lot of the characters uh, only one character annoyed me, and I think that was just uh, like I think that was purposely done the way he was. Like it, it yeah. just annoyed me personally, but like it obviously didn't annoy you. Well, and look at this on IBM. Um, they okay. First of all, they got a four point nine rating, and for this film to have a four point nine rating out of ten is pretty fucking good. They had a twenty five thousand dollar budget. That's yeah, it. That's that's impressive. That's it. So like. When you watch this movie, watch that with that in mind is that these guys had no money. Like $25,000 is isn't a lot of money. That is uh that's actually cheaper than Basket Case which was in the 80s. Wow. Cuz Basket no. Case was 30,000. I'm going to look up Beyond the Shadows quickly to see if I can see their budget and just to give you an idea of how much better this uh this group used that those funds. And that would have included paying their actors, wouldn't it? Yeah, I would assume so. So that would be actors, set, getting permits, all that other shit that you need to do. Yeah, and once again, this is a, they did this smartly because it was all in one location. They did. Like, there was them driving in some part, but there wasn't, okay, so the budget for um, Beyond the Shadows was only 10, and it definitely oh, okay. reflects that it was 10. But I think if people want to make a movie, you need to look at movies like this and then check out the budget and go, hmm, this is what I'm going to be working with and not fantasize that it's going to be something that it's not. Right. You know what I mean? So I, yet again, check it out. If you're interested, it's on Prime. It's a free watch. It's an 80 minute runtime. You're not spending a lot of time on this film. Um, it's fluffy. It's easy. And if you don't mind low budget or you're interested to see what someone can do with $25,000, take, take, take a look at it. Yep, I was going to say, uh, Dave Z, I recommend watching this, even though I know you have your Dave Z cover test. Ignore the cover to this, but I recommend you check it out. I think you would like it. Um, but yeah, the next ones, one, two, three, the next four are ones that I watched that Heather has not seen yet. Um, but I will start with one that I've heard a few people already talking about, and that is called The Night. 
Uh, it's an Iranian horror film, and the synopsis is an Iranian couple living in the U.S. becomes trapped inside a hotel when insidious events force them to face the secrets that have come between them in a night that never ends. Um, this one uh, I thought was really well done. Once again, great acting, great performances all around. Uh, the only thing about this film for me was I I was messaging Heather, and I was like 20 minutes into the movie, and I'm going... Well, I think I already know the twist to this movie, and if it does it, I am going to be so disappointed. And yep, sure as shit, the twist happened, and I was disappointed. I won't say anything about what it was or what it was leading up to or what it reminded me of, because I will just spoil it. But I, this is one of those films where I want to listen to uh, Fresh Cuts, because they're getting ready to do this episode. And I want to hear everybody's breakdown on this film because I'm wondering if I'm missing something, but watching it, like it felt like it was inspired by The Shining a bit with the way the stuff in the hotel happens, which, you know, not if you're going to be inspired by a horror film, The Shining's a good one to be inspired by. But uh, yeah, I just thought this one was interesting enough, but also not for me. If they did something different with that ending, this could have been a much higher film for me in my, like, where I would rank it. But, like, right now, it is something that I at least recommend people to check out, because they may like it more than I do. Once again, this just may not be for me. But, yeah, I'd say it was a pretty decent watch, and I want to get, I want to see if Heather watches it and get her opinion on it, because I am very curious. If you want me to watch it, I'll watch it. Um... Is it a political horror that talks about the wrongs of society? Nope. So I know it won't um, be in your top 10. <laughs> but it is kind of like, a, it is, you know, an Iranian couple living in the U.S. So you got like, okay, a little bit be, of that stuff. there's something I can't, I have there to be angry about. So that's good. Yeah. Okay. There's, you know, the whole immigration type thing. Yeah, you know, I'm sure I'm filed, I'll find something that I can get on my high horse and bitch about. So that's good. <laughs> um, no, it sounds interesting. Is it, is it available anywhere yet, Scotty? Um, I am not sure. Sure. Okay, actually, I just realized there's a spot for where to watch. I did not realize that. On Letterboxd? Uh, did you know that? Nope. Uh, so there it is. Yeah, you so simple, it's on Amazon. Simple Scotty. Well, you're usually the one that does this, though. Because I'm the boss. Because you are the bomb diggity. Nah, the boss. Boss. Oh, I'm sorry. The boss. The yes, boss. thank you. Thank you. All like right, you got, you, <laughs> like a boss. All right, you got the next one now. Yep, yeah, the next one. All right. So this one is called Redwoods Massacre. And is based on Scott's trip to the UP. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those movies that I kept telling Heather, if she watches it, she's going to be coming back to be going, Scott, I've told you many times, and this is the reason why I say avoid going into abandoned buildings and stop being dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a story about a group of urbex, which apparently that's a word, but uh, urban explorers, but... Uh, a group of urbex enthusiasts travel to the backwoods of Appalachia to capture footage of abandoned houses when they unwittingly become the subjects of a much darker video made by a different kind of quote unquote enthusiast. Oh, so dark. <laughs> and this is a straight up uh, found. <laughs> oh my gosh. Ooh. <laughs> He's evil in the woods and he wants never seen this done before. Anyway. <laughs> I will say that this is a found footage film. Mm -hmm. um, and right off the bat, I'm going, oh, I kind of like this idea of like, because it reminded me of instead of uh, instead of Urban Explorer YouTube. Uh, is it Dora the Explorer? Yes. <laughs> but like instead of uh, the Urban Explorer YouTube personalities coming together to meet up for the first time, I was like, this could this kind of reminds me of like us podcasters that have become friends over the Internet. because That's kind of what these guys have done, deciding to meet up and either like just doing a huge get together or just doing something to hang out. I, I was like, I like this idea. That's really cool. And um Though it starts off with the first half, I'm going, okay, I'm really liking this. They're going through different abandoned houses. And they're like kind of like finding some messed up stuff. They're not sure what's going on. Like they don't know if it's just like old things. They find like blood on a bed and like. Okay, you give so many spoilers. Oh my God. <laughs> but this is, this is, I wouldn't. God even... just tells how the movie ends. So we just know well, not to watch it. <laughs> I wouldn't. I... I was going to say that's not even a spoiler, honestly, because it doesn't have anything to do with like the plot. Okay, so they're just crazy YouTubers that film shit. Yeah, they're just filming everything and just like kind of, you know, 
pretty much if you watched any abandoned uh, YouTuber explorers, like it's kind of what these guys are doing. Nice. And yeah, I like the first half of this film because it was like, okay, this is kind of a cool direction. I I'm digging it. Like, and then it goes to the generic found footage. Like, okay, why are these guys still continuing to film? Why is this still happening? And then just it falls apart and it gets kind of confusing and muddled. Oh, boo. But like right off, like at first I'm going, man, this is not that bad. Like I'm kind of digging it. So I'm kind of disappointed that it ended up like that. So I would recommend if you're a found footage enthusiast or just want to see a low budget film, kind of just do it, taking a different take for a bit. At least it'd be worth a dollar ninety nine rental or worth for free. Other than that, I wouldn't bother. Uh, it, right now, it looks like the only place that it's available to watch is on Direct TV, which is a new one to me because I don't think we've seen the uh, seen that on our list of movies before. Yeah, we have. Oh, have we? Hey, you don't listen. I try not to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the love that we share. I know. We're like <laughs> fuck you, no fuck you. No, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> Whatever. The mo- we're gonna make Beyond the Shadows. That's the movie we're gonna make. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We're gonna, make a sequel. we're gonna be paranormal investigators going to a haunted house. No, we're podcast paranormal <laughs> podcasters going, going to-, to a haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's haunted. I would so like. I always say this. I'd be the first to fucking die. Like I'm not one of these chicks that is gonna like live to the end. <laughs> There's no way. And, and I'm and I'm one of those guys that's going, oh, what's that noise? Let you are dying too. Neither one of us are going to make it out of life. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. I'm that stereotypical guy that's just like, ooh, what's that spooky house? Oh, ooh, there's a noise coming from it. I must go and look at it. I feel it. like, actually, you scratch that. You're going to be the first to die. I'm going to be off banging or drinking somewhere, and then I'm going to die. That's well, probably, probably, gonna probably what's going to happen is I'm going to be the first to die because you get annoyed with me and kill me. No, no, I don't want to go to jail. So, but you, but you're gonna die anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, well, yeah, I guess you make a point. True, <laughs> can't argue that logic. <laughs> logic, right there, babe. You know what's funny? I was in side note here. I was listening to our previous episode and like how you watched YouTube for a bunch of fucking movies, and I feel like coming up to your list, I'm seeing down here, you did the same thing this time around, didn't you? <laughs> the finest that youtube has to offer <laughs> we will get there <laughs> okay let's get to the next one you, All right. you saw this and i didn't yeah this one is uh this one looks stupid so i didn't want to watch it oh no this is the one that i was highly Sorry. <laughs> this is the one that i was highly recommending last night to you i, I didn't realize i invented your great ancestors there Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> God, you're a oh my I can't god! Can't believe you thought this movie looked dumb. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, but this is one that I was actually looking forward to after I'd seen the trailer last year. Uh, it's directed by Neil Marshall, and that is The Reckoning. Uh, in the aftermath of the Great Plague and amidst the subsequent witch hunts against women, a young widow grapples with the tragic death of her husband in a society completely consumed by fear and death. Because she, re- I'm not going to read that because that's a spoiler, so I will cut that off there. But um, this is basically... Is this a historical piece? Yes. This, this is historical uh, horror. Okay. This is the one that I've told you why. multiple times. This is historical horror. Sorry. Fuck, man. We've watched so many fucking 2021 movies. I can't keep it straight. So, oh, you were thinking this was a completely different movie? No, I have no idea what you're talking about at the time. I, I don't know this one. I don't know this yeah, one. Yeah, this is I, the one that I was ranting and raving about all day yesterday. Uh, well, like, we talk a lot. so <laughs> and, you just, and you just don't pay attention to me. I see. God, if I listened to everything that came out of your mouth and tried to absorb it, I you'd would have be, no space for anything else. You'd be so much better off. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, just talk about your fucking movie so we can move on. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, this is... Uh, I was excited about this because it's Neil Marshall who did Dog Soldiers, The Descent. Oh, Dog Soldiers! Now I remember. Yeah. Wait, did you tell me this when I was... I told you this while you were sober during oh. the day, multiple times, and then last night while you okay, were in well, party mode. Okay, well, I was mode. really fucked up last night, so you can't really... But but the during the day? Hmm? Well, you never know. It was a Friday. <laughs> 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 you only live once, Scott. Uh, that's true. But uh, he's also been a director of a lot of the like epic, epic episodes of Game of Thrones with the major battle scenes. So I'm going, ooh, a historical horror film did you star as one of the midgets in the game of thrones battlefield i wish because he got laid a lot <laughs> scott's like i mean living my best fucking life if that was the case right he all i mean he does say that he is the god of tits and wine mm, that's a good place to be yep and what was it he also says uh 
the way I want to die is with a tit in my mouth and my dick in the other. Nice. That's a good way or to Or a live. dick in my hand. <laughs> yeah. Cock in my hand, tit in the mouth. <laughs> so, yes, I would love to live that life. But anyways, back to the movie. <laughs> um, this is a very high production quality. Like, I don't see that it's released yet, Like, I, but it's got to be because I know a lot of people are talking about it now. But uh, if it's not, it's going to be one of those theatrical releases because this is really high budget. But it's basically about a woman that gets falsely accused of witchcraft and pretty much has to deal with the witch hunters of that time, tormenting her to force her to admit that she's a witch. And then burn her. And then if you know anything about his history, you know that shit is bullshit. And every time they've tortured somebody, they just basically tortured them till they couldn't comprehend what was going on anymore. And they would admit to atrocities they never did. Or they would just kill him because that's just how men are back in the day and probably still are. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, true. But I am a huge fan of like fairly accurate historical horror. Like, obviously, you know, you can take some liberties, whatnot. Cause, but, uh, I would, uh, recommend that this is, or yeah, I would recommend this movie. It's one of my favorite films I've seen this year, like in my top five for sure already. And this is like a good double bill with Black Death, which was one of my favorite films of the decade. Mm. And yeah, I am just fascinated by the whole like uh, Black Plague and just like the false accusations. Like I'm, a, I'm, I've always been fascinated by that part of history. And this one, I really, really loved. The acting was incredible. Um, the effects were amazing. It's well directed, just well shot, haunting score. Yeah, I highly recommend seeing this film. This is one that is getting mixed reviews. So, you know, take take my word with a grain of salt because, you know me, I love everything. But I do recommend you at least watch it and make, an, uh, make the judgment for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And now this one I wanted to bring up because... The next movie I want to talk about is definitely a micro-budget indie gem that I highly recommend everyone watch. This is called A Ghost Waits. Um, it is pretty much about this. It's like a romantic, horror, supernatural comedy. Uh, it's about this guy that uh, works for his landlord buddy that comes and fixes up houses uh, before the new tenant moves in. And for some reason, he keeps getting called back to this house because no, he, the landlord cannot keep a tenant staying in this house for too long. And so he goes there and he's crashing on the bed because he's like, oh, there's, got a, there's a lot of work to do and I'm just exhausted. I'll crash here. And then he starts realizing that the place is haunted by a female ghost. And this is like when I, when I was watching it, I'm going, yep, this is something I could see at festivals like Sundance and stuff like that because it's very character driven, um, very artistic in the way it's done, but not the artsy fartsy, let's show you pretty images and you decide what it means type shit. This is just a really, really well done film amazing acting like a really fascinating story and you know me i'm i like whole relationship style horror films and this kind of borders on the relationship style horror um this is just like a very very hidden gem that i highly recommend everybody check out it's just very well done if you want to see low budget done right watch this and apparently this is uh thanks to our buddy xander kane he was talking highly about this film as well Ooh, ooh, Sander. And uh, he said that this is actually streaming on Arrow Video's streaming service. They're the ones that picked up the rights. Sander loves Arrow. Sander he does. and Arrow sitting in a tree. <laughs> 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 oh, Sander, he's going to be like, fuck you, Heather. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, um, yep. God, are you done talking about your movies yet? <sighs> yep, we just have one left to go that you and I both seen. Oh, yeah. Uh, so do you want to take that one? I guess. Everyone knows this dropped. It was on Shudder, and it is called The Queen of Black Magic. Um, this was the second Shudder release this year. Of ex- I think it's an exclusive, right? Uh, yes. Right. Um, better than Hunted. <laughs> <laughs> Way better. <laughs> um i enjoyed it yeah it's a it's also an indonesian film i believe isn't it yep yeah. uh, and actually uh by the it was written by the same director that did impetigor and uh satan's slaves joko anwar so i think i will be pretty confident in saying that if you enjoyed those films you will enjoy this uh definitely more gory than all those other films i think yes oh my god this this movie had some very horrific scenes 
and I'm not sure what the fear of bugs would be called, like the phobia. But if you have a fear of bugs and holes and crawling, you might not want to watch this. No, if you have things of fears of things up your hole, you're definitely not going to want to watch this film. <laughs> Take Scotty's advice. Um, it's it's a solid movie. I you know I don't want to say too much. It's on Shutter. I think a lot of people are going to be watching it. If you enjoy um, you know a uh, an emotionally built in ghost story with a ghost that is seeking revenge or vengeance, I think you will enjoy this movie i will say that the last act is on fire the last 20 minutes particularly leading up to that it's a little slow so pack your patience it is a 99 minute runtime could have probably shortened down a little bit but definitely worth the watch on shutter and may grace some top 10s this year depending on your preference yep uh i will be shocked if it's not in my top 10 because i freaking loved this film uh the only issue because i didn't think it was that slow for me personally but the only issue I had is way too many characters to keep track of. Mm-hmm. Like I thought, like, I won't say much more, but yeah, I just thought there would be a, a thinning of the herd, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But it was hard to keep track of a lot of the characters. But I still just loved the hell out of this. It was so unsettling, some horrific scenes, just a messed, messed up movie. And I, I definitely really, really dug it. Um, apparently this is also a remake yes it is and I had no idea about that but apparently Shudder just dropped the original as well onto their service so I'll have to watch that at some point of course you do after you're done with YouTube Um, (laughs) I'm never gonna be done with YouTube the finest that YouTube has to offer so that's our our 2021 watches so far so you know Scott and I have shown with each episode how selective we're being with our views so I'm (laughs) sure everyone really appreciates that um I can just imagine when we'll eventually slow down yeah, eventually we'll get there. You know how we always start off strong in the early, but then we well, get... and then eventually we get more picky, right? I think, yeah. uh, you know, unless you know, unless something really tickles our fancy, then we begin to uh, give up. So, older films. We'll touch on some older films that we've been checking out. As you know, Scott and I have a constant journey for Hammer and Italian horror, and trying to like them more than we already do. Um, I watched Tenebrae, which is uh, by Dario Agento, 1982 film, 101 minute runtime. Very good film. Very, very good film. Um, Well done. Great characters. I just don't know if Italian horror is for me. (laughs) Like we just keep going back to, I don't know if this is my fit, Um, but a very, very good movie. I'm I'm glad I saw it. I I do think I understand the long runtime. It does make sense. I do get it. Uh, but I don't remember much of the movie, and I saw it like a week ago. Now, mind you, it's because we're also watching a billion films all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that could have something to do with it. And I also enjoyed Torso, Torso 1973. Yeah, that um, was the one I thought you would like the most out of everything that we've suggested so far. Yeah, uh, very good film, very much a slasher, psychosexual. I love how many, like, titties are in Italian films. Lots of titties. Oh, they just love their nudity. They love their nudity and titties. Everywhere titties. Titty, 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 bang, bang. Yeah. <laughs> um, very good film. I, my goal is to watch two 70s, ideally more Italian movies per week, uh, so I can spread it out a little bit. And I can definitely say I respect these films. Uh, I can see why people admire them. I, I just don't think they're my fit, you know, And but I'm going to keep trying. Um, I will say Torso was one of the higher ones that I enjoyed. Um, I, you know, I enjoy films like Alice, Sweet Alice. I really liked that. I think it just depends. I just, maybe Italian horror isn't for me, but I'm going to keep watching them, see how it goes. I've had some good friends reach out to me and saying that they're going to share Sander Kane being one of them. That's right, Sander. Um, and I, and Android as well. Android for Android Vision. Uh, both yep. have a lot of knowledge as well as Brennan Orlick, as well as Scott have shared some with me. So I'm just going to keep moving through them. And then finally, I watched Would You Rather? Um, yes. And I kind of avoided this film because I basically got spoilers and I knew it was going to happen. So I didn't bother watching it. And then I put it on one day. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good film. This wasn't an uncorked film, was it? No, I, I'm not sure who did this one. Like, it reminds me very much of an uncorked film. Um, really good special effects. Jeffrey Combs is in it. Yes, um, I love Jeffrey Combs. He's such a prick. Uh, he's, but- he plays pricks so well. Yeah, like he does play a, a really good prick. The main antagonist or the protagonist is good. Um, so I was surprised at the ending. I didn't see the ending coming. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that coming. So, well, I knew it was going to happen, but I, okay, I should. I knew it was going to happen in the movie, but there was one scene at the end just before we get to who wins the game 
that I didn't know about um, the interaction between the main character and another one, and then the outcome of it. I didn't know yep. what was going to happen. Uh, that was really shocking for me. So very good films. Um, now Scott can talk for 15 minutes about his YouTube trash that he's watched. And, and actually, Missy, uh, not a single one of these were watched on YouTube. So oh, huh. Tubi? Nope. Uh, every one of them would be on a good friend's plex, except for one, which was Prime. All right. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is um, I want anybody that is knowledgeable about the Hammer Horror films to let me know if this is for sure a Hammer film. I think it's not, but it's uh, Madhouse from 1974. I believe it is Amicus that produced this, which I believe Amicus is part of who produces Hammer. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know they're list- they'll listen and let me know. But Madhouse is basically about a famous horror movie actor who ends up uh, getting committed to an asylum for a murder that he may or may not have committed. And then when he is released and everyone feels that he is well, he comes back to reprise his role. As, I forget the doctor's name, but it was like some doctor that he was playing as a villain to replies, reprise his role in this movie as a return to movies. And while he's back on the set doing all this, uh, people on the set start dying f- in ways that represent uh, are reminiscent of what happens in the film. Uh, the reason that I watched this, though, is because it had the always sexy and amazing Vincent Price as the main yeah. character. And I would say this one was a bit of a slower film for me. Like, it wasn't just grabbing my attention as much as some other Vincent Price films. But I still really enjoyed this and the whole who done it type atmosphere and the whole this is all happening on on set of a film being made, which is like a really cool concept. And it also stars Peter Cushing, which is also you know just another fantastic actor. But I thought this was a pretty decent watch. Um, I was not disappointed by it. Uh, just not a not one of my favorites from Vincent Price so far. But yeah, definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, then I go to the themed movies for or continue my themed movies for the animals and horror episodes. And the first one I ended up watching was called White Dog from 1982. And man, I had never heard of this film, but this was also on uh, Mark Nato's The Horror Cast, 100 Hidden Gems. So yeah, that was I remember one of the him re- talking about this one. Yep, so I, this is the one that I was like, oh, it's an animal movie that fits along with a the theme. So I'll check this out. Had I remember him vaguely talking about it on the show. Man, what a heavy watch, because this is pretty much about a woman who adopts a beautiful... A neo dog. Yeah, a beautiful white German <laughs> shepherd that's ended up being trained to hate... I was trained attack- by Tucker Carlson, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aaron, that was for you. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> but yep, it's trained to attack Black folk, and... This woman pretty much takes him to a rehabilitation center to try to be retrained and break him of these habits that he had been that had been ingrained in him. And it's just a very, very well done movie. I can see why it's on the hidden gem list. Like this was really well acted. The dog actor was incredible. And it he was, was so, a little boy. Oh, he was so cute. Oh my god. I just wanted to boy. love him. But at the same time, it was just such a very heavy, hard film just because of the topic that it's covering and like just kind of, you know, going through the rehabilitation of this poor dog. But man, Do you notice how much detail Scott's giving about his movies. <laughs> I was like, torso. It's great. <laughs> Scott's like, oh, let me go into great detail about white dog. <laughs> uh, I can't help it. I know. I'm all like, <laughs> fades over it. You're like, and then it's important that we know exactly what happened. It's like, it's like always back to the quiz. I don't know. Scott, just figure out the instructions. I sent you the link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I highly recommend this movie if you have not seen it. This was a very good movie, but yeah, just be warned it is a heavy watch. Mm. <laughs> So this the next, one, I was really jealous because you had access to this next one and I didn't. Oh man, this one I almost didn't put on the list, but I'm going, I have to talk about this. Nice <laughs> uh, this one was available to me on Prime. And just because we're doing like the exotic pets and horror type episode, I was, I was curious to see if there was any horror films that had to deal with hamsters. <laughs> Surprisingly, not a single one really where the hamster is like a villain. But Heather ended up finding this one as well as I did when we were Google searching and she's going, oh my God, check this out. 
And this is called Horror and Hamsters from 2000 and was 18. Yeah. Um, so this is a horror anthology that has nothing to do with hamsters, except for in between each story, you get this cute little break of just watching these cute little hamsters playing and doing cute little hamster things like playing in a hamster house or eating little hamster sized pizzas. And I'm trying to remember the names of the hamsters, but they were so adorable. This is a Canadian made film. So you have some famous hamsters over there in Canada. We do. We do. Um, but I know Was one, one of them named Christian. Yes. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, one thing I did want to do though, is read like the, I'll, I'll say right now, the anthology stories actually weren't bad. Like they were fairly entertaining. Um, and I will have to say that this is, uh, one of those films where, yeah, you go in pretty much to watch the hamsters because they're so cute. And I wanted to read, uh, quick, uh, what was it a quick review on letterbox for this movie? Cause it just sums it up perfectly. Uh, let's see. I'm scrolling down to the reviews right now. And oh, where is it? Okay. Five stars for the hamsters. Their names are pork chop and dump truck and they're cute as fuck. What is up with the concept here? Horror stories intertwined with cute hamster videos? Like I said, hamster stuff is solid, but two cute little, just two cute little hamsters playing on mini playgrounds and eating tiny slices of pizza. <laughs> that was, everybody's reviews are not talking about the actual horror sh- segments. They're all just talking about the hamsters. Here's another one. Couldn't care for the horror. I just wanted to see more hamster adventures featuring pork chop and dump, dump truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Oh, uh, but yeah, I, I just had to watch it because I was just like, this is going to be probably horrible, but at least there's cute little hamster videos in between each segment. But yeah, it was actually not that bad. And the hamster segments were adorable. So adorable. <laughs> That's uh, super cute. <laughs> Uh, but then the next one I will go and talk about uh, is Ben from 1972, which kind of ties into our theme for tonight, which is the sequel to the original Willard. And Ben is one of the main rats in Willard. And this is pretty much happens right after the events of Willard, like like almost right, right away hap- events. And Ben ends up escaping with uh, like his pack of rats and he ends up befriending this little boy and like basically just like it's just so ador- like so adorable just because the little boys become friends with them kind of like willard became friends with socrates um in this one and like it's just uh pretty much the kids just trying to hide uh hide ben from the cops because the cops are actually trying to investigate any rat infestations anywhere trying to hunt down the rest of the rats because they found willard's diary and what was going on and yeah so it's pretty much just a hide and go seek with the rat and the cops and but man this is such a well done movie like i was just like so just in love with the character development between the child and ben like it was just so just heartwarming and just like you didn't want anything bad to happen to either of them you didn't want like you actually were rooting for ben and it just oh very, 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 very good movie that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, and I believe this has been picked up by Scream Factory now, so it's now on Blu-ray. But it, for the longest time, it was not on anything but VHS because there is a Michael Jackson song that was made specifically for this movie. And then the studio lost the rights to it after mm. Michael Jackson passed. Mm. Uh, but yeah, this was just very solid film. Um, not, I would say it's not as horror as Willard was, but it's a damn good continuation of that story. Awesome. Yeah, and definitely recommend it. Awesome, awesome. So uh, what we've been listening to, I'm going to do some shameless promotion. I was going to talk ah. about something else, but I changed it. So, yeah, because, so you changed it. Um, and, and honestly, it's not because I'm in it. It really isn't. It's because of how much work Lacey has put into it. Yeah. Um, the Slumber Party Massacre podcast We'll be dropping this month. Um, the brainchild behind it is Lacey Lou from Cut to the Chase podcast, as well as uh, Skip to the Lou, which she just recently started. This was her idea to have an all-female podcast. So she asked myself, uh, Rebecca Reinhardt from um, In the Mic of Madness, as well as um, countless indie horror films and she's on a bunch of other podcasts as well too uh, Carly who's also from his and hers movie podcast M versus M movie podcast as well and um, myself 
And the four of us have gotten together and recorded our first episode, which was the Slumber Party Massacre movie, of course, was our movie review. But we, it's a three-act podcast. We, uh, we have some horror debates in it. We also talk about what we've been watching. And it's very refreshing to be on with just other women. Um, typically, all of us work with, with other men. And the guys are great. And we definitely enjoy our time working with them. But there's something to be said about having a full female-centric podcast Um, yeah so many female podcasts out there i'm sure this will be the first one on the dark discussion network and it will be dropping later on this month we have recorded it Lacey is editing it um and Lacey is extremely creative and i feel like she is the one that deserves to shut us out here not like rebecca and carly are great as well but it, it you know we're showing up to her party and and she's leading it and i think that you know Lacey is someone who is a jack of all trades and a master of all, which is really rare to see. She writes, she's creative, she does great movie reviews, she has very solid opinions, she can back them up with fact, and I think that really speaks to high quality. So if you want to hear an all-female podcast, of course, we'll share it to the Friday Nightmares page if you want to listen. Um, you know, please check it out. It may not be for you, but um, but yeah, I want to give a shout out to that. Not necessarily because I'm on it, but because of the work that Lacey has put into it. Yeah, and this is a monthly show, right? Yeah, it will be a monthly show. Yep. I cannot, I am so damn excited to listen to this because it's you it's for the uh, four of the greatest podcasters out there that i know and i and Aww, all of you Scotty. all four of you working together it's I, ju- I just can't wait it's gonna be so much fun to listen to i i will be day one download and listen as soon as it's available Aww. well that's there you go we got one download i expect the rest <laughs> of you to all follow um and what are you going to talk about on here uh me i am going to talk about a friend of ours uh one of his side projects but uh it is our buddy brandon young oh, yeah podcast. In his podcast, Anatomy of Fear, but one of his side projects is he's going to need therapy. What a great title. That's so funny. I love it so much. Especially with the theme of what this revolves around. like Right? Yeah. Him and his 12-year-old son, Joey, uh, and he's pretty much introducing Joey to these horror films, and they're doing a group team-up review, uh, father and son style review, and I was listening to, I've been listening to him for a little while, and it's just I love it because Joey is so well articulated. Like he definitely takes after his father, and uh, but he's also got that like childish like love and heart for everything. Um, and uh, it's very he's very whimsical. Uh, and the last episode I listened to was their last one they'd released, which was on The Shining and Doctor Sleep. And I just love the way that uh, Joey made the review for this. He's like, so I'm going to give, uh, so I'm going to do a rating and my rating is going to be one out of rain. And Brandon's like, why rain? Well, cause I love rain. Oh, all right. And he's like, so I'll give the shining sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. That's cute. That's <laughs> it was cute. just adorable. And he's like, and Brandon's like, why did you choose sleep? Well, because sleep's better than uh, sleep's awesome and better than rain. <laughs> Sounds like a real sweetheart, actually. He is, and he, like, but you can tell, like, he knows exactly, like, he he definitely takes after his father because he knows a lot of what's going on in these movies, and like, uh, just has a love for him as well, which is great. Brandon's very smart. Um, he is he is well spoken to. You know that saying, you speak, you uh, what is it? Um, walk softly, but carry a big stick. Yes. Yeah, that reminds me of Brandon Young. I oh, really absolutely. think he is in a caliber of class and um, the way he articulates all on his own accord. So I'm not surprised that his son follows that because, yeah, that just makes sense. Yeah, I, I just enjoy it because it's just fun listening to like, it's fun to hear a child like that, like that age, just like kind of being introduced to these horror films and getting his opinions. That is really awesome. That's cool. And, and is that on the Dark Discussions Network? I, I'm not exactly sure if oh, what the fuck, on. Scott? I looked, but I couldn't tell if it was on a network because I was able to download everything and I'm not, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, But I will post the links and everything to his episode or to his uh, show in the show notes. There you as go. well as... um. If the episode is out by then, I'll do the same with the Silver Party Massacre. Awesome. Yes. And everyone can download it and listen to more of me. Yes. In case you haven't had enough of me. Um, by the way, do you guys have a podcast page for that for Facebook? Not yet. Okay. Because I was going to say, I'd at least uh, put the link for that too. But uh, uh, pressuring me. I'm pressure. The pressure is on, Miss Heather. Pressure. 
coming down on you. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So we're going to take a brief break and then we're going to be back with our second part of Pets in Horror. So after these messages, we'll be right back. This will keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. And welcome back. This is our part two of Exotic Pets in Film. So we're not going to cover off on too much research at this point. We're just going to look at some of the top five exotic animals that are popular in television and film. Um, Anything on this list surprise you, Scott? Because you can see it before I read it out. Um, Actually, not really, because I've seen quite a few of these, uh, though, like reading on like some of the training and everything that's pretty impressive yeah no kidding right so um i went to filmthreat.com and we talked about or they gave a list of the five top exotic animals that are popular in television and film so the first one is boas boas are among the most popular snake in film they're an iconic creature and many of the large varieties of tree boa put off an air menace pull off an air of menace will be really safe animals to handle and be around uh, constricting states can be dangerous to a single human in an uncontrolled environment when they reach prepos- preposterous proportions like an anaconda. But for most parts, a well-fed boa has no issues being handled or being around people. And even if they get aggressive, there's literally very little harm they can do beyond drawing a few drops of blood and some bruising. Skates will always ha- snakes will always have that mysterious, menacing air. However, we don't expect them to go anywhere as we don't expect them to go anywhere as far as movies are concerned. I agree. And I like snakes. Yeah, snakes I, are um, uh, very interesting creatures. They are. I'm I'm weary of snakes that are poisonous, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, you know, but we live in North America. We don't, we have something called the Mississauga Rattler out here, but like, it's not, you get bit, you should get to a hospital, but like, you're not going to die within seconds of being bit. Yeah. Snake. And I think that's the same with like the rattlers that we have around. You guys would have the country. Mississauga Rattler too. Yeah. Especially up in the UP. Yeah. Well, I'll say in Michigan, I don't think we have too many. I, like, I don't think we even have any rattlers, maybe in the UP. In the UP, but... you would for sure, because it borders with Canada yeah. and there's rattlers up there. I'm, I don't think, what, you think the rattlers don't cross the border? Yeah. I was just going to say, like, I, I'm just saying from what, from like the. They don't have I've... little rattler passports. Yeah. They don't, they, can't, <laughs> they, they don't have their enhanced license. Heather, come on now. Game, like, business. <laughs> How long is your stay? <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to be staying for a while. <laughs> like, that'd be really funny. Anyway, uh, number four is chimps. Chimps are a common feature in films. They're most often displayed as highly um, intelligent comic reliefs and are the most are and are most likely animals to have their own role in a production. Chimpanzees are also among our closest relatives in the animal kingdom with a very similar genetic sequence to Homo sapiens. I remember people would be like, you're a Homo sapien. <laughs> I, do that? Like, I remembered that. Cool. We grew up in like such a dirt time in the 90s. Anyway, oh, we sure did. <laughs> they are smart in ability to, and are able to learn many actions. It's only natural that they find their way onto the silver screen. Um, yeah. So chimpanzees are very close to humans in some bad ways as well. They're all, they are often responsible for horrendous attacks on humans. Um, coupled with the fact that an average chimpanzee makes a human strong man look weak, we have an animal that should only be handled by trained personnel. Facial expressions are the only reason that we see them 
facial expressions aren't the only reason that we see them increase in becoming digital on the big screen. Yes, there have been many, many a times I've heard of like horror stories with chimpanzees, maybe not on film, like on film sets or whatever, but like in real life, someone had a pet chimp or whatever. And like, I think there was a woman that had her face completely like destroyed by one. Oh yeah, I believe it because they're fucking strong, right? Yeah. Um, colorful, large and capable of speech. It's no wonder that parrots are able to be the stars in their own right. Whether they are comparing a pirate are or repeating information that they happen to overhear, they're excellent plot devices when just not used as window dressing for a shot. Uh, there are a hundred species of parrots out there. Many of them are kept in private collections across the planet. Um, if there's one iconic parrot, however, it's undoubtedly the red macaw. 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 A large macaw. <laughs> a large parrot is a large parrot, which is still a common pet. The macaw is a perfect blend of intelligent speech and buoyancy to work in film. Unlike many of the animals on this list, macaws are also good pets, which gives them another leg up. And then finally, yeah. well, finally, but something that's been around longer than all of us is crocodiles, alligators, and chameleon and caimans yep. have made their way onto film. Like big cats, they are often presented they've been often presented since the beginning of the industry and they often find themselves in a ceremonial round for a shorthand more than that however these creatures are often used to show a danger of an area hmm. calm by you water suddenly surging with alligators to show how much danger our protagonists are in during their journey i love alligators alligators are so fucking awesome and same yeah. with crocodiles and they are pretty much our living remnants of dinosaurs now i don't ever want to be close to one no. um ever ever but i do admire their tenacity and their ability to survive through the ages i think that's pretty fucking awesome um you know due to lack of public knowledge you know alligators crocodiles are used interchangeably there are minor differences, but honestly, you have to be someone that actually understands their their lizards, amphibians to actually get yeah what's what. Um, I can never tell the difference personally. Like I know uh, crocodiles are like the much more they're larger bigger. version, yeah. and like their jaws are wider. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's crocodile that can be salt water and fresh water. Uh, yes, I believe so. I think yeah, I think alligators can only be salt right. water. Um, but yeah, and we'll be talking about more about that later on. Yes, we will. And the largest and most colorful of the large cats, tigers, have been featured in films since the early days of Hollywood. You know, from the plotting Shiran Khan to the recent <laughs> slow motion chain wreck of the Tiger King. They can be found <laughs> in all sorts of media. Though the Tiger King is not a place I would go to to see how animals are no. well represented. That the documentary, it, you know, I didn't give a shit about where whether carol baskin killed her husband or not i was appalled by the treatment of the animals in that series yes, and the people was... that went and supported those fucking stu- sues you're a fucking moron like <laughs> sorry you don't walk somewhere like where you see animals kept in that small cages and go oh this is fine yeah like, absolutely not choose where you spend your money people like common fucking common sense but yeah because exactly. i'm right there with you i was disgusted by that absolutely yeah. disgusted you know, that was definitely something that they dropped during quarantine because it never would have been watched any other time. Yeah, exactly. Um, the tiger is still one of the most requested animals, but they're increasingly being replaced by CGI. The Lord of the Jungle is a bit too unpredictable to truly become a star. Um, lions, jaguars, and leopards all have been featured in similar roles. So, yeah, I would definitely say big cats are very <laughs> difficult to manage and to use um and exotics and small animals are used constantly in film we have several movies we're going to be talking about so yep. you know as we talked about in our previous um films or our, fam- our, pre- our previous episode about uh, pets and horror animals aren't always treated nicely and i think it's really important that you do your research and i'm going to give a disclaimer that i didn't like how some of the animals were treated in some of these films now this is dating back to the 70s so yes. i can forgive it because you're looking at something that's over 40 years ago but i would be lying if i said that it didn't bother me a little bit now yet again here. 40 years over 40 years ago heather i can't get on my high horse and bitch too much but i think as we continue to see less and less animals in films there's a reason why that unless it can be done humanely, it's not done. And I appreciate yep, or that. done with CGI now. Yeah, or done with CGI. And I think that that's something that you can that you can definitely do because there's no reason to make animals, you know, us, those were real bunnies, um, yeah. rabbits or whatever, but they weren't, they were just basically left to hop around places. Yeah, they weren't and, really put in like stressful situations. You know, and and I and that I can handle, right? It's it's when 
they're grabbed certain ways or certain things happen to them that it's it's a little hard and I think the first two movies on here were a little tough for me in some scenes um and I just want to give that disclaimer before we get into them so I'll let Scott take it away with our first one well I will just uh say the same thing I completely agree with you but uh yeah uh so the first movie that we decided to bring up for this topic is because uh, you know, there's all sorts of animals out there and like so many different, like we could probably still do another episode at some point that features other unique pets, but we covered the ones that, you know, we've most commonly heard of, like besides cats and dogs. But mm-hmm. the first one that we're going to do is Night of the Lepus, which was released on October 4th of 1972, an American science fiction horror thriller film based upon the science fiction novel The Year of the Angry Rabbit, written in 1964 by Russell Braddon. It concerns an infestation of mutated rabbits. Uh, but yeah, pretty much that's a, these uh, rabbits have basically become an infestation in this small little country town. And they have been uh, basically being a pest, destroying everything. So they were trying to find ways of humanely trying, quote unquote, humanely trying yeah. to uh, thin the population by, I think it was like some type of hormone injection that would keep them from wanting to basically fuck all Pre- the time. Reproduce, yeah. It would prevent them from reproducing. And well, one of them ends up getting injected with this hormone that ends up making them grow larger and larger and larger and well, the parents didn't realize that they gave the wrong pet to their daughter and the rabbit escapes and to a rabbit hole and starts breeding un- out of control some extremely large, quote unquote, large rabbits that just look so freaking adorable. Oh my God. Watching these oversized rabbits take down these dollhouse sets was probably the cutest thing of this fucking movie. Yes. Um, it, you know, I really did enjoy the fact that they addressed that an overpopulation of rabbits is a problem. You know, I will give this film credit that, you know, we think that that isn't an issue. It, it is when you don't have, you know, an eco balanced system where you don't have coyotes or foxes or, you know, natural predators. Yes, you can get overpopulation. Like, look at the deer in Michigan. Yeah. That's you know? when we have our hunting season to kind of thin it out right you have too many deer so it it can be a thing and it can damage crops and you know for farmers that rely on farmland and you have these these rabbits basically destroying it i can understand where the the plot of this movie came from and you know i can appreciate that they don't want to use pesticides they don't want to poison the rabbits and kill all of them they want to just find a way to prevent them from breeding which i'm not sure if that's even less cruel or how to degree of less cruel that is but you know it's 1972 so we'll forgive it for 1972 right um they they used a lot of rabbits in this and i doubt the animals were treated that well um no and- there are certain scenes like where it was a real rabbit and something happens and I'm just going, I uh, don't like that. Right. And and yet again, like this is Scott and I, and this is 1972. So we're not like going to get on our high horse here and start like losing our mind. It happened. It happened. Um, I just think it's good that we give that caveat because I think you're watching this. If you're an animal lover, you may have a difficult part at times. You may, you may yeah. not, you know, um, and but I did appreciate like honestly the best part of the scene is when they take these like miniature sets like little dollhouses and they put these rabbits in to make the rabbits look massive it's yeah fucking hilarious I, like, like my it's favorite so part funny. I think my favorite one was when they had overtaken the grocery slash convenience store yeah they're just all sitting around just like being rabbits just they're all just sitting there and like or or when they like kill people like you just kind of see like a rabbit mask like a big yeah. head that's used and like blood everywhere as they're as they're kind of basically taking their revenge against these humans that have you know mistreated them and and all that kind of stuff and and they're really having a hard time stopping these fucking rabbits so it did really portray the rabbit behavior of rabbits kind of just expanding and rabbits are bosses like my friend has two rabbits and they're big and like (laughs) they like fucking stand their ground and shit like they they beat up the cats i was just gonna say that uh it's it's hilarious she has these two cats that are afraid of the rabbits because the rabbits are like you want a fucking piece (laughs) (laughs) they they don't back down no Um, rabbits uh don't give a shit especially like yeah like because especially if they get big because uh 
my brother had one that he had rescued from a barn because the mother had died and it was still a baby. Mm -hmm. So he rescued it and like kind of nursed it back to health and took care of it. And next thing you know, it's become pretty much like a house cat. It would like sit in my mom's lap and just chill like a a cat pet it. And, but yeah, like they're bosses. Cause like there was one time I came over to visit and all I'm seeing is three cats booking it down the hallway and the rabbit hopping behind them, just chasing them out of the house. <laughs> yeah, like the rabbit just doesn't care. And it's interesting because cats could easily take down a rabbit. Like really yeah. all they have going for them is their ability to scratch and their ability to bite. Now their bites are painful. Um, yeah. I would argue so it was a cat bite, but I don't know. So the Night of the Lupus, I really think that, you know, for the time that it was made, I I really enjoyed the special effects that they used. I thought it was really cute. Um, it was hard to be afraid of these rabbits going running because they're obviously just taking video of rabbits running and just like making it look like it's bigger than it actually is. Yeah. But like it was well whole... done. It was well done. Like, I think, it, you know, if you want to see some special effects from 1972 and well done, I recommend this film. Yeah. Cause it's a clever B movie. Like it's obviously panned for yeah. being just ridiculous and cheesy and everything, but it you can't help but be entertained by it and just like laugh at like how ridiculous the situation is and like because i mean the rabbits really like when you're showing them on screen like i mean cats and dogs you can train them to be menacing looking yeah but rabbits you can't train to be menacing they're just just, hopping around doing rabbit things right yeah you know, and and I really I'd like at the end they have to line up all the cars and what do, how do they they line up all the cars and what do they do? They shoot them. Is that what yeah. it is? We saw we've seen so many movies. I'm losing track. Yeah, they uh, pretty much like shoot them, uh, kind of like funnel them in and force them to go in a certain direction towards those cars. And yeah, like everyone's like blasting their. Yeah, horn. they heard them. Yeah, they because they do that because like a herd, right? So yeah. there is that kind of herd mentality with them it has an eight percent rating on rotten tomatoes i don't think that's fair i don't think this is an eight percent movie on no i mean people that probably reviewed it like that are probably going and not it not expecting it to be cheesy or something they expect it to be serious but but how could you watch i know (laughs) this movie and be like oh man definitely super large rabbits i'm gonna walk in and take this fucking movie very very seriously oh so the thousand of rabbits make their way into the trap where they're shot and electrocuted oh that's right it was electrocution that and then koi t- cole tells roy that the normal rabbits as well as like coyotes have returned to the ranch the ending shows roy and jerry running a grass field where the normal rabbit is shown eating shown sitting on the grass before the credits roll so but kind of like when the rabbits get super huge you're kind of like well you guys were kind of treating these rabbits like shit like yet again i understand the whole issue with the ecosystem and stuff but you're kind of like no (laughs) it's like you kind of have this coming you're you're genetically engineering at this point and that's not cool right and the little girl sees the massive rabbit and like that's how it all gets started they find out and she sees it and runs out of the mine and i it feels like a made for tv movie i but it i wasn't. believe it, w- it wasn't no it was actually released in theaters wow. how many how many and the and the poster said how many eyes does or have how many times will terror strike and then what else does it say i wonder if i can read here they were born that tragic moment when science made its greatest mistake, and now from behind the shrouds of night they come, a scuffling, a stampling horde of creatures destroying all in their path. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's not far off. That is what they did. Like, yeah, I mean, well, and that is kind of what rabbits do, and if there were extremely large rabbits, they would be a very destructive force because they just destroy everything because that's just they love to eat and like it, yeah that's why they're considered pests because they do just kind of ravage everything and they really are cute pets and i feel like that's why this film was so hard is because if you yeah. do like rabbits i could see if someone you watching this film and and you're in a situation where rabbits have fucking destroyed something of yours and you're like yeah like they're assholes and you and you get the kind of maltreatment that's towards them at times um because they can be a rodent they are a rodent they can't be a nuisance but fuck this movie was cute like if you yeah. just want to watch oversized bunny rabbits it's like oh watching just oversized bunny rabbits for yep, an hour pretty much <laughs> right it's oversized bunny rabbits pretending to eat people absolutely <laughs> it was a great use of rabbits i don't think this film could ever be redone um and if it was redone it would definitely be a lot different how the animals were treated and there'd be a lot of cgi um yeah. i don't think you'd be using a lot of real rabbits and that's fine um but yeah it, it's definitely a product of its times fun for the 1970s uh if you enjoy science fiction horror films and you enjoy rabbits 
um, and you want to see rabbits fuck things up, I suggest watching it. Yep, I agree because yeah, it's because this this was both the first time watched for both of us, and yeah, that was because I've heard about this movie. It's been it's notorious. I've heard about it for several years, and but yeah, I'm glad I finally watched it because yeah, it was just so ridiculous but so entertaining. And the rabbits are so damn cute. But I'll jump on to the next film, which this one I have a feeling might be hard for people to watch because I believe this one is still stuck in the VHS era and it has not come to DVD or Blu-ray yet. Um, but this one is called The Fangs, which, is released, which was released December 1974. A snake lover sends out venomous snakes and reptiles to kill his enemies. <laughs> Very short plot synopsis, but that is... Well, and I love the fact that they say reptiles because there is no reptiles in this. It's all snakes. It's all snakes. This and, this this movie is one of the most fucking ridiculous. Oh my god! Films I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, you oh watched this because I remember you watched this first, and you were just like, "Okay, we got to add this to our list." Oh, we got to. It is it is literally a dude who owns a bunch of fucking snakes as a pet. Um, he's friends with the school teacher. And he brings the snakes in every Wednesday to the school and the kids go out and they get like rabbits and mice and uh, whatever else they need to do to feed the snake. And then the school finds out and they don't want her bringing the fucking guy there anymore with the snakes. And then his best friend ends up getting married to this woman who's a gold digger <laughs> that has that ridiculous dance scene. I loved it though. It, um, sure. Unnecessary completely for the movie, but oh my God. And the acting between her and this <laughs> guy was fucking hilarious. Um, oh man. <laughs> and you just feel sorry for this dude. So this dude's basically a social recluse um who doesn't really have any friends except for the one sheriff that's his friend um snaky bender is his name well and you thought and you thought she was his friend but the teacher that he uh keeps bringing him back to show these students these snakes but she has other weird reasons for befriending this snake guy yes oh my god so basically i'm just gonna jump into it now she apparently is extremely turned on by snakes and like has him come over during certain evenings and bringing some of his snakes to wrap around her so she can like get undressed and start fondling herself and touching herself while snakes are crawling all over. And yeah, she did. I think she actually fucked used a snake as kind of a dildo. I think at one point, did she, I didn't see that part. Yeah. Um, it's like, it's pretty much when she was undressing herself towards the end. And I think she was like rubbing it down there. Oh boy. Oh yeah. Boy. I was like, what um, the fuck? <laughs> yeah. The snakes weren't treated too well in this film. Honestly, no. it was, it was, and I guess people would be like, no, they're snakes. So who cares? But I don't think it was the best, but it's the fact that it, the lean character's name is Snake, Snakey Bender, I think is all yeah. you need to know about this film. Um, this movie is so just ridiculous. It is, it is definitely trash, but it's, it's trash that you can't look away from. Yes, exactly. Cause um, and you brought up the question, I think in here, if this could be remade and yeah, I think this is one of those films that could easily be remade and, but it would be nothing like the original. No, you would, you would, you. I think you'd want to steer clear of being the original to try to make something a little more. I, I, well, I think you could use the erotica scene. Yes, but you would be using CG snakes, or you would have a couple of snakes on her, and then for other scenes, it would be CG snakes, especially if it was a sexual thing happening, like to just put a snake around your your wrist or your shoulders and stuff, and. I don't think that's causing the snake any trauma. It's no. it's more like the throwing around of the snakes that they do yeah. and other shit like that that was a little <laughs> concerning. But anyway, but like, long story short, is this guy basically, you know, he has it out for the main grocers in town. He has it out for his buddy who married this chick who gives this crazy sexy dance because they just got married. And <laughs> so this guy, so Snakey Bender comes over to his friend's house every Wednesday night and they, li- and they, they call it concert night and they listen to records and shit. And it's the same song and it's like the most it's like i think it's almost like the national anthem or what is yeah. that song but it's like the most like generic song you can think of that you hear everywhere oh man it's super generic but anyway they have these concert nights and like this chick is like he's like no i just got married and we got plans which is basically they're gonna fuck all night is the indication yeah. right? <laughs> um so he leaves but he doesn't really leave he kind of watches and she does this crazy little sexy dance where she basically strips down and then he ends up picking up her up over the shoulder and going to the bedroom. <laughs> I remember being like, that oh, looks like something I would do. 
<laughs> I kind of thought that too. I was like, hey, Heather probably really dug this scene. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, it's like, I was Friday night for me. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then like, anyway, so all these people do him wrong and he just fucking snaps halfway through the movie and he kills all of them with the snakes. So he finds a way to have the snakes kill them, but then he like drives their cars out to the middle yeah. of nowhere. And, and just he's, sort of drives it off a cliff every time. <laughs> the same cliff. So <laughs> there's a pile of cars. Anyway, um, the snakes used in this movie was was very clever. Um, he kind of talks a little bit about the different kind of snakes that they are. He uses them to torture. Obviously, they're supposed to be some poisonous snakes. So if you're afraid of snakes, I think this movie will resonate with you. Definitely, there's a, he does a good job of using them, but <laughs> it's such a trash 70s film. But you can't look away. This yeah, this movie, is... You just can't look away from, even if I... you want to. <laughs> I think I was messaging you when I was watching this and going, what the fuck am I watching, Heather? This is insane. This is ridiculous. And yeah, it was just like, I think the moment that uh, that made me say that this is insane and ridiculous was when, yeah, they had their Wednesday band night and you watch them for like five, 10 minutes, just jamming out to this most generic song and talking <laughs> about how amazing this is. And like, yeah, and it's, I'm so like, funny. oh my God, this is so stupid. What are we watching? And then that's it just like, got That's weird. not even in one of my bands. That's not Dead South. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what Scott and I do when we listen to Dead South when we get together. Yeah, I was gonna say like that. Like Dead South would be a good uh, band to put in the soundtrack for a new version of this movie. That's for sure. <laughs> like, oh my god, this movie! But like, I really was endeared to this film. It is yeah. the funniest shit. Like, it's so dumb, but at the same time, I was like, oh man, I get why Sneaky Bender's upset. Like, shit. Yeah, like the poor well guy. Like, I felt yeah. bad for him. He, the dude got treated like shit. Like the yeah. only one guy. The only one I didn't feel bad for was uh, like, or the only time I didn't feel bad for him is when his friend got married. It's like, okay, you know, that'll happen. But yeah. like your friend will like, but like, I guess when his friend was treating him badly afterwards. Well, when like, his yeah. friend was like, we can't hang out anymore. I'm yeah, married. I was going to say, <laughs> we can't hang out anymore. Like, that's when they draw the line. Like He's like, I can't see you because I'm a bride. And he's like, your bride's a gold digger. And he's like, what do you say about my wife? <laughs> <laughs> that he literally just met and married. <laughs> like he just met and married her in like three weeks. But um, <laughs> yeah, the 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 erotica sect, the, the snake scene is probably what people will either enjoy or be confused by. Um, yeah, I, my mouth just kind of hung a gape going, no, this it's not really. Wait, she isn't. <sighs> she is oh my god what the fuck you know what i, I watch this and i'm like yep fucking 70s film <laughs> <laughs> so true <laughs> right so that is fangs could it be remade yes would it look very different yeah yes yeah <laughs> be a remake only in like basic plot of dude being rejected and using his snakes like For almost revenge. similar to will willard to be honest with you only yeah. snakes um yeah, exactly <laughs> but like if you like 70s films and you like real hidden gems, I actually really recommend checking out Fangs. I it's hard to watch on the treatment of the snakes, but if you if you want to watch some cheese cheese and like just some good old fashioned like over the top sneaky movies, then I recommend Fangs to you. Yep, if you there if there is a way that you can find this, I bet it's on YouTube somewhere. So Oh, it's got to be on YouTube. I would it's recommend I would recommend searching it out and just seeing the ridiculousness that is this movie and mm -hmm. you'll be enter more than likely entertained. And hopefully one day it gets a Blu-ray release so Scott and I can buy it. <laughs> right. Like I mean I, personally I hope every movie that's went to VHS that's you know a legit movie I hope all come to the physical like to the new formats of physical media just cuz you got to it's it's a uh, film history. You got to keep keep these things uh, preserved. I don't even know what snakes were in this movie. He listed some. I don't think they were fucking accurate. I think they were like, and this I, is a blah, blah, blah. I'm sure they didn't even fuck. They just made it up. <laughs> I, well, I know he mentioned coral snake in the one with the barrels, the kill with the barrels. Oh, is that what that was? Yeah, because the coral snakes are extremely poisonous. So like, and then he's like, yeah, if you guess which barrel correctly, or if you get put in this specific barrel, you won't get bit by the coral snake. But then he had the coral snake in all three of them. <laughs> oh, he was so fucking... <laughs> Snakey Bender. I just oh, love that Bender. name too. Snakey Bender. What a fucking name. All right, let's move to our next one here. All right. So the next one is a little more well known. Um, this one is Alligator, which was released on November 14th, 1980. A baby alligator is flushed down a Chicago toilet and survives by eating discarded laboratory rats injected with growth hormones. The small reptile grows gigantic, escapes the city sewers, and goes on a rampage throughout the city. 
Um, this movie, at uh, first off, uh, uh, shouts out to Jerry Herring because this is one of his favorite films. Yep. Um, now that we got that out of the way, I really like this movie. I have such a hard time with the laboratory testing piece and the fact that in one scene they talk about cutting out a dog's vocal cords so it doesn't bark. Yes. Um, yeah, it's not even lab rats that are getting discarded. It's freaking dogs they are discarding. So right, that synopsis like, is wrong. That is a very difficult um, scene to sit through. I do, I can't believe they sell pet alligators. I don't know if that's a real thing or not. Yes, it is. I feel like it is, and that's fucked up. Um, and the dad flushing it down the toilet, lots of people do that with pets they don't want. I have heard that happening a lot. Well, so and I, then this also is based off one of our urban legends we talked about, like, and it was even brought up in that urban legend movie about. You know, uh, an alligator getting flushed down a toilet grows large in the sewer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is exactly what happens here. Um, I think this movie, out of all that we've talked to up to this point, is the most realistic of things that have happened. Not that an alligator is going to get this big, right? survive in the sewers. I don't think that at all. But I think that the flushing the pets, the laboratory um, stuff that are, that is done to animals... All of that is is quite accurate, and I yeah. will give it credit for that. And I like the main cop in this. I actually find him quite endearing. This was a yeah. second time watch for me, and I really found him quite endearing. Yeah, because this was a second time watch for me, because the first time was when I was, like, really freaking young, like, nine or ten, maybe, and mm -hmm. then rewatching it now. And, yeah, like, the cop, like, because when I was younger, I didn't care about a lot of the human stuff. I just wanted to see giant alligator go on a rampage. Of course. But, yeah, watching it now, like, yeah, you... You want you are like rooting for the cop to like solve what the hell's going on, like prove that he's not going crazy with the giant alligator in the sewer, and then you know the whole him getting thrown off of the force because of like the shit that's going down in the media, and yeah, and I, you even want him and the girl to hook up. Yeah, like I even liked her, and I I thought she was quite knowledgeable. Well, and, and did you realize who she was? Well, yeah, she was a little girl from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't know that's good. Well. <laughs> When that when that got revealed, I was going, "Oh no, shit!" <laughs> oh, you didn't know that she was Ramones. Yeah, I did not realize that was her. Ramon. Like until like she got revealed at the end. I'm going, "Oh no!" Ramon shit. was like, "Fuck you, bitch." Um, this time it's fucking personal, and right? I really enjoy the part where okay, like you have the scene in the sewers, like in the in the inner city where like they hire that alligator hunter or whatever. Oh my it, god, that alligator hunter! Those dudes and you know it comes up out of the sewer and the kids are like, oh my god, it's fucking massive. And she's like, how did alligator get this big? And the idea that it's been mutated, right? But I love when it shows up at that fancy party. I oh, love that wreck shit. And like how the special effects, like the actual mechanical alligator, like that's fucking awesome for 90s. Yes. Like this movie is just so good with how they use that mechanical alligator and how it just fucks everything up. I love it. Yeah. And like they even like, uh, like, uh, yeah, they didn't do it. Or yeah, I think they did do this where he attacked one of the guys in the sewer. But he even did the whole, when he bit, he rolled. Yes, he did the death rolls. Which, you know, a lot of movies, they don't really focus on that. That's the way they kill their victims. Yeah, no, you're right. It was it was really like, fuck, it's a good movie. I feel like yeah. a lot of people have seen this film, but I think, A, it really presented, you know, the lack of responsibility people have with pets and whether people should have exotic pets. And I think it also really talked about the horrors of lab experiments. Like those are the two things yes. I really pulled from this film and what happens when you take an animal who has been discarded and then eats other discarded animals and it comes back just fucking kicking ass and taking yeah, this is This is definitely where nature is getting its revenge. Yeah, like it's just so good. It really is. And it's a great moral tale to it. I really, really loved that piece of it. Yeah, and I wanted to kind of uh, jump on like when you were saying like you didn't realize that alligators were sold as pets. I don't know if they still are, but uh, one of my- At that time they were. <laughs> yeah, I'll say at that time they were and at least 10 years ago, because about 10 years ago, my friend was talking to me about how he had a pet alligator and like it had gotten too big for him. But what he ended up doing was taking it to an animal reservation place. Yeah. And they, and they took care of it. And like now it's just part of like, you know, the reservation and like taking well, taken really good care of. I mean, that's your friend being a responsible adult, but how many people don't do that? Yeah, exactly. Because like- I and mean, if when you an kill alligator it, gets... you eat it. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I understand yeah. people do eat alligator too. And I'm not here to, 
you know, pass judgment on that as well, as long as it's done humanely. Um, I just, I don't know. I just think exotic pet, like, what the fuck are you thinking? Yeah. Getting a fucking pet alligator for your kid. Like, it just, like, there's lots of lizards you can get that don't grow to that I was just going to say, like, yeah, you can get a lizard that grows to its environment. Yeah, like a gecko. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, they're super popular because they're little and... Yeah, and I think some people also don't understand the lifespan of reptiles. Like, they can yeah. live a very, very long time. They could outlive you. So, yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, like a fucking bunny. You know, snakes and alligators have been around a very long time, and they will probably outlast us. They can't catch COVID. So, you know, <laughs> we're batting. You know, I have my money on fucking Ramon. So yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah, I I I dig this movie. I think it's such a fucking fun watch. The special effects in it are mint, like just mint. I, I you know, I I don't know what else to say. I just that that scene where it shows up at the mansion and fucking eats everybody, and the car scene, and the limo, and he and he gets that guy in the limo. Like it's just so fucking good. Watch yeah, this that, movie if you haven't watched it, everyone. It's worth it. Yeah, time. this is this is one of those '80s gems that yeah, I highly recommend because it's just so much fun. It's just really easy, simple watch. A little difficult with the beginning lab stuff, but yeah. um, other than that, though, like if you just, it's like one of those turn your brain off sci-fi horror films that you just have a blast with. And I do love that uh, scene where he does get the alligator hunter that's all cocky, yeah, because uh, he goes and he just gets he instantly does like dude doesn't even put up a fight. He just instantly gets like swallowed whole. And you just see him getting more and more swallowed as the alligators chopping It's great. Him. Like the special effects that were done here and the mechanical, op- like I'm sure that alligator was a fucking bitch to operate. Oh like, yeah. Great. Like it was just great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Highly recommend this one. A lot of fun. And another one that I think we'll both be recommending. Uh, and this one, I, yeah, this is probably one of the more popular ones on our list, but that is Arachnophobia, which was released on July 18th, 1990. It is a 1990 American black comedy horror film directed by Frank Marshall and starring Jeff Daniels and John Goodman. The, f- the film was released by Walt Disney Studios. Uh, oh, sorry. The, it is the first film released by Walt Disney Studios Hollywood Pictures. It was Marshall's directorial debut, debut and its plot centers on a newly discovered prehistoric spider from Venezuela, which is transported to a small California town. The spider produces an invasive species of deadly spiders, which begin killing the town's residents. Um, I'm going to kind of just briefly talk about like the first time I seen this. Uh, I actually seen this in theater with my parents. And yep, I think like most people, when this movie came out, this gave me a good fear of spiders afterwards. Like I was horrified. Like I legit, like every spider I seen, I didn't want to kill it, but I wanted to stay the fuck away from it. You know, I've never really been afraid of spiders. The yeah, no, only I'm not. time any spark of fear comes up is if, like, you know, occasionally you get that, oh, man, these bananas came up from South America, and there was a deadly spider in the bananas. But I think we forget that, especially for Scott and I living in, you know, climates that are fuller seasons, it's very tough for these poisonous spiders to survive up here. It's extremely cold. Yeah, um, I think the most, I think the most dangerous one that we can get is maybe the occasional black widow and the brown recluse right and even then you're not like i think brown recluse is the one that will survive black widows need a pretty high temperature yep. in order to stay alive so people sometimes keep them as pets um or tarantulas as pets like famously in home alone yep um, i was saying my brother used to have uh, right. tarantulas and scorpions and i think the thing that people need to realize with spiders especially like tarantulas is that they're very delicate. Um, I went to a spider exhibition several years ago. I think I talked about it on this podcast before. And spiders, like, they they can be hurt really easily. And they really are more afraid of us than we are of them. So when you get a spider bite, like... spiders aren't going out to hunt you down they're not no, they're <laughs> usually doing it to protect themselves because they're feeling threatened exactly right and and this film you know does expand on the concept that these deadly spiders are smarter than regular spiders in that yep. they are hunting down humans uh it kind of gives that impression it's obviously over exaggerated but the spiders are well used um yeah i was <laughs> worried about when this was oh sorry what was that no i was just gonna say from the opening scene in venezuela quote unquote to you know the closing scene in the house where jeff daniel's trying to get out of the house with all the spiders everywhere i i think that the use of the spiders was 
was well done. Um, the humane treatment of them, I don't understand how you humanely treat spiders. Like, I don't know what would be need to be done for that. Yep, I was worried about that, like, when I was, because I was like, I'm wondering how they, you know, trained any spider to do what they were doing. And, like, I was wondering if, like, uh, you know, these spiders were treated well. And I did some investigating, and I found out a little bit about both. Well, first, when you were saying, quote-unquote, Venezuela, that actually was Venezuela. Oh, did they actually go to Venezuela? Yep, okay. that was part of the, the research I found. That I was like, oh, interesting. I've been um, to Venezuela. What was that? I've been to Venezuela. Have you really? Yeah, I went on a cruise years ago, and we went to Venezuela. Oh, look at you, Missy Fancy Pants. <laughs> like, Mrs. Mrs. Okay. Well-traveled over here. I <laughs> know, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, was doing some digging, and I found it kind of fascinating, uh, because the spiders that they ended up using, uh, where was it? This, uh, da, da, da. Uh, it used over 300 Avondale spiders, which are from New Zealand. They were chosen for their large size and their unusually social lifestyle and harmlessness to humans. And uh, the part that I found interesting was the way they ended up, because you cannot train a spider. It's an insect. You, there's no training any type of insect that I can really think of. But the, so I was wondering, I'm like, okay, how do they get the spiders to go where they wanted them to go on the, like in the scene? And what they ended up doing was using uh, different styles of heat and cold to force them to go where needed. Oh, that makes so, sense. Yeah. So they'd put like some cool weather behind them to make them run away from them because spiders always want to run away from the cold mm -hmm. temperatures and mm -hmm. they would usually run towards the heat. So I, like, I was like, oh, that is kind of fascinating how they ended up doing that. And obviously the large general and the queen spiders were articulated models. But uh, nice. I did find out that, yep, none of the spiders actually got harmed on set. They were like brought over by spider handlers that were doing all the handling of the spiders. Didn't they some made... of them escape though? Uh, nope, none of them ended up escaping. Um, there was actually, like, that's a different movie, but uh, the cockroaches in Creepshow ended up escaping and causing an invasive species. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, none of them ended up escaping because they were only using like a handful of them, except for in the final scenes where they're putting like a bunch of them on the walls and stuff like that. But yeah, I thought that was really good to know that they, yeah, they were treated well. They were like just kind of brought out in their little uh, habitats released and then carefully picked up put back in their habitats like right after each scene was done yeah uh, and it was smart that this was in the summer hence why the the spiders are able to survive in the hot continent yeah. um they did a good job of like you know the parties outside that they throw for the doctor of showing that it's warm out um windows open at night like i that's a nice little touch to it so that you know obviously makes sense that a, a species could survive it bred with a species that's already there so the idea that it's survival you know techniques or ability to survive in that climate moved over i don't have a yep. fear of spiders this didn't make me afraid of spiders at all like if i was in a situation where a room was covered with them yeah i'd probably be a little creeped out but like I think if only they were poisonous and I and I thought I would get multiple bites. So yes, like I think definitely in those situations I'd be concerned because you know here they bite you and they you basically die within <laughs> yeah within seconds because you're going into seconds. cardiac arrest. You're having a stroke, right? So you know I that's a lot of venom for a little spider to have. So yeah. I you know I um yeah I, I definitely enjoy the film. I can see why it's so popular and D Jeff Daniels and John Goodman. John Goodman, oh, John Goodman in every was the film. Oh, like, and he was the best, and he was so fucking great in this. Just like that cocky ass pest exterminator. Like, and he plays some great. I saw him in Red State yesterday. Oh, and yes. like, holy fuck, this man is so diverse. You know? Yes. Um, I also recommend you watch the uh, Ten Cloverfield Lane with him in it. Oh, yeah, my I have God. to watch that this year. Like, he is just such a great actor, and and Jeff Daniels does good enough. And um, though his wife is well known too, she was in a bunch of stuff as well. Um. So, like, definitely they had some quality actors in here, and uh, yeah, like, it, and, like, the whole mystery of, like, at first you don't think it's a spider, or other people don't think it's a spider, they think he's just a shitty doctor. Yeah, and, and calling him Dr. Death. Yeah, and things get worse and worse, and the spiders get more and more populated as the movie goes. Like, it's actually a really, really well done film, put some good money into it um yeah i don't know i got i don't think it should be remade either i think I, you know nope, this... someone was to, to go ahead like i don't i wouldn't care but i think it's great the way it is like i don't think it needs to be updated yeah i was gonna say for a movie that is uh shit 31 years old now it's still like watching it, it up. yeah i'll say it still feels like a modern day film um I, and I was going to say, like, uh, the one thing I do love about this film is how it represented, like, in an, in an, an invasive species causing havoc. Yeah. Because that does happen, like, when an invasive species comes to the U.S. or to Canada. Yeah, like, yeah it does. It, it, it does happen. We've had, um, 
uh, fish. We had a fish problem up in Canada where our fish or carp or something was breeding with a Japanese carp and it was eating all the other carp. Oh, yeah. Are there fish? Yeah. Like it can happen. Absolutely. Yep. And I, and I also have to say, I love the fact that we got Julian Sands as the spider expert that was from Venezuela. I, yes. He's, I just love Julian Sands. He was great. And, you know, I feel like this movie also reflects to the pack back to if you're going to have an exotic pet like a spider, fucking take care of it. You know, like yeah. they're fragile creatures and don't fucking just get a spider. If you if, like people that just get tarantulas and don't care for them and shit like that really piss me off because like it's yeah. it's only a little thing it relies on you for everything it's life is kept in a little fucking box basically like at the least you can do is fucking take care of it like yeah, properly absolutely like yeah because like that is like that is one thing like because even like that is one thing i'll say about my brother too is he took care of his spider and his scorpion very well that's good to hear because they are exotic pets they are you know, yes, they can be dangerous, but let's be real. We're a whole lot more dangerous to them. Yeah. Like one of a handful of those poisonous spiders are nothing for a human. Put on some gloves, get some shit going. And you can squash them all within seconds. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's, it's people that don't know how to take care of exotic pets that get exotic pets that are really the problem. So, but no, great movie. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Yep. Yeah, I'll say one of my favorites. Um, and then, yeah, we will uh, jump on to, one of our other little furry companions that have uh, that has gotten a bad rep, but is one of probably the most wonderful pets you could have. And that is, uh, well, we'll talk about, a, we got two films with them in it, but the first one we'll talk about is Rats, which was released in September 17th, 2002. It's a made-for-TV horror film written by Frank DC and directed by John Lafia. It is about a clan of rats in New York City transformed as part of a DNA research trial into man-eating killers who take over a Manhattan department store and threaten to overrun New York City. It was known as The Colony before it was released and originally intended to be aired on September 11, 2001. Its release was delayed until after the 9-11 attacks. Shots of the World Trade Center towers were removed after the attacks. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I suppose that would have been a bad day to release this movie. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would have not gone over too well. Well, I mean, it just wouldn't have gotten paid attention to. Too much at all. Going on. Yeah, at too all. much going on in that world, in the world at that time. Yeah. Um. Yeah, this was uh, one that you had recommended me check out as well, because you, mm-hmm. once again, watched this before I did. And yeah, this one, like, they use a lot of CGI rats in this, mm-hmm. but at the same time, they have, like, which is good, because with dealing with as many rats as they show in this movie, like, you would have to wonder how well they were taken care of. Yeah, um, right. And and you can't manage that many rats. Like, how are you going to manage? Like, yeah. especially in our next film, how are you going to manage the volume, right? Like, you have to be reasonable with who you're going to include and how you're going to include them right so yep absolutely and yeah that's like this movie was where rats are like extremely vicious and yep showing signs of intelligence yep like beyond because what they, they are. went to the lab and yeah. they went to this underground lab i really like the exterminator in this and the main yes. book. i actually for a tv movie i enjoyed the character development of this film like i actually cared what was going to happen to everyone involved. And I think that really does speak to this film. Um, I I really like how it takes place in this high-end department store and they kind of want to keep it under wrap because it's looking really bad and they're finding, you know, rat droppings everywhere. And the rats kind of don't have a personality in this. Like they're not... Mm-mm. they're kind of just seen as a pest yeah there's the a scene, swarm there's swarm but the scene where they overflow the pool and oh that was freaky so the main character's daughter is at this community pool and these rats are becoming such a problem that they they get into the pool system and they go into the pool during a swim meet and obviously this is cgi at this part because you can't have a bunch of rats just swimming around in the pool though they can't swim makes sense yep. they are you know, able to swim. And they're, I'm like, that's fucking freaky. That would freak me out if I was in the water and I saw a bunch of rats coming towards me. Like, and I'm not really afraid of rats, but they do carry a lot of diseases if they are not domesticated rats. Yep. And I don't think I would want a big swarm swimming up towards me. So that no, was especially, cool that scene. especially with them being as hyper aggressive as they were. Yeah. Like they were pissed. Yeah. Um, and I mean, and, and every single time they got bit, like there was a disease that was given to that person. I yeah. forget what the disease was, but they think they were put out for a while. Did you not love the like non needed nudity that was in the beginning of the film? Oh, <laughs> once again. <laughs> and this was made for TV. How did they get away with it? it must have been like a I, cable I show am, or something. It must have been because this chick gets topless. 
Yeah. Right? Um, she's in the dressing room, which is where, you know, this is in the first five minutes. I always spoil these movies anyway. Um, and she basically gets stripped down to try on these jeans and this shirt without a bra. And the rat bites her and she gets super sick and she gets hospitalized and she gets some crazy disease that like only drug addicts get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like fucking like mm. intense. Um, but yeah, the main the main exterminator, he's very knowledgeable. Like obviously he was written well. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot about rats from this film, actually. Like the the chewing that rats constantly chew. You have to dull their teeth. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, yep. like I actually found this film, obviously it's not a, you know, documentary educational thing on rats, but I learned a lot from it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because like, even in movies, they will, you know, have some truth to what happens. And yeah, like, yeah, rats' teeth just keep, like are so strong and keep growing. That's why like they're great chewers and why they keep chewing. And they, uh, and there's a part at, at, towards the end where they like, you know, over overhaul a sub um, a subway. Yep. They're they're you know running towards the subway and they're getting in the car and they're falling on people and and they're hyper aggressive because they were in this lab and they escaped and the lab was abandoned and they were given all these kind of yet again we're looking at labs and animal testing gone bad so there's a lot of themes that have to do with that in at least a couple of our movies. <laughs> yep. um, but yeah, I I don't know. I feel like for a made for TV movie, this is really worth your time. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I, I thought was, it was cool. It, it was a good little story. Yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised by this, and yeah, just had a lot of fun with it. It's, it's kind of along like, along the lines of like B movie, what you would put, you know, mm-hmm. like the Lepus in and all that stuff. But it's like if you're going in just to watch like a, just animal attack movie, like you know, set your expectations to a certain level, and with rats especially. And uh, yeah, this was highly entertaining. Uh, I do have to say that the filming, maybe because it was like uh, kind of like New York or whatever, but the way it was filmed and made for TV makes so much more sense now. Because yep, it looked like it was uh, looked like it was being filmed for a Law and Order Law and Order episode. Yeah. So I just wanted to hear dun 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 dun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just play it in the background all the time. Totally. But, <laughs> yeah. No, it really was. And honestly, the acting for the made for TV was pretty fucking good. Yeah, the acting like, was really well done. <laughs> you know, it's it has a little bit of that '90s cheese to it but you you actually really get behind the two main protagonists and like yeah. i actually really wanted them to have a relationship yeah like you actually like because <laughs> you're thinking like especially with the woman the the female character she was uh like at first i'm going okay she works for this like upper class high-end uh Hotel, retail like store a retail store yeah like yep, a bloomingdale's so kind of thing right That's yeah really and what it was supposed to be and she's like this you know high up executive in the company i'm like okay she's gonna be like the pain in the ass character that the exterminators got to deal with and like no she's all about like wanting to do everything right and she's yeah. a great mother and like trying to just do everything good for her child and stuff i was like you could ro- totally root for her as a character and like i'm not gonna lie i wanted to date the dude i was like you're a great dude like yeah he was like a r- really good dude great great with his, great with her daughter like just a nice guy and like very clear to the point of what the problem was and like i don't know and like the contents between her and him usually i find like romantic stories are just sprinkled in for no reason yeah like i bought one... into them as a couple i was like right. yeah i really hope this fucking works out <laughs> like, yep i was the same way like it, it just like you actually felt something for the characters it was yeah really well like done. you cared so and i think for a tv movie that's pretty impressive this is strays man those two movies have really surprised me on how much i liked them and yeah. how much i bought into the characters yeah, like, I think we'll have to do an episode at some time for made-for-TV movies. Just- yeah, because I think there's some of them out there that are just, it's a shame that they you just think made-for-TV, they're going to be shit, and they're not necessarily. No, especially the older ones like this. Right? Well, I guess we'll finish off our rap movie with this one, which definitely pulled on the fields. Oh, my God. God, yeah. Like, this is the one, so, where rats didn't give you a character with the rats. Yeah. This movie definitely brings in character. Yeah. Um, But that movie that we are going to be talking about is the remake of Willard, which was released on March 14th of 2003. Willard is a social misfit uh, and is stuck between taking care of his abusive mother and a cruel boss. When he realizes his unusual connection with rats, he decides to use them to, to his advantage. Uh, and this stars Crispin Glover, which fuck, did such an amazing job. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. one thing, like before we even get into touching on the rats, just you feel so bad for Willard, how he is treated. Mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. is just, they treat him like he is just awkward and dumb and just walks up, gets walked all over because he's just kind of a meek character. Well, you know, what's funny is that it, his co-workers don't treat him that way. No, it's the boss. It's this and- crazy over the top. I didn't think his mother was abusive, though. 
No, um, like she was fucked up, but I didn't. Yeah, like and demanding. I think, men, I think more like mentally abusive because she was like, even, you know, I didn't really get that either. Well, because she was like, you know, you're never gonna find a woman Willard with that name Willard. I hate that name. Why don't you be Johnny or something like that? From now on, your name's Johnny. And just like I could see that kind of being like mental abuse. Yeah, I I guess. Yeah, there were some throwaway lines. I just found that she was so crippled and sick and. Yeah, I think yeah. it was like part of that is probably because she was just had probably dementia and sick. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Like, so, like I feel a lot like of she could be just ill, but yeah, like that's neither here nor there. That's not the basis of this movie. The basis of the movie is his relationship with the rats, specifically which, what two rats. Yes, which oh my god, like the way they build this relationship up, like I all I wanted to see was Willard Socrates and ben that's all i wanted to see on the screen i didn't care about anything else at that point because i just loved the relationship and kind of hated the relationship they built with those three i really appreciate the fact that socrates was a white rat and ben was a black rat yes and i and i and definitely um socrates is a domesticated pet rat yeah uh, with how well trained this rat was to sit on his shoulder or there's a part where he's thinking of cutting his wrist and Socrates comes and just nuzzles up to him. Nuzzles up to him. Um, that part where Socrates was stuck on the sticky paper broke my heart a little bit. Oh, um, yeah. I had a really hard part with that scene. Um, but I, I've never had a pet rat. I've had people, I know people that have. And yes, absolutely. I think there's a clear difference between domesticated rats and wild rats. And even wild yeah. rats, I don't think are going to, they're just looking for food and they're looking for shelter and they're looking to survive yeah but once again um, would only bite you if threatened and i would not want to be bitten by one because no. of what they carry but i you know i don't i don't have a fucking hate on for rats i don't no. um but i did think this film did a really great job of setting the, the protagonist which is socrates and the dread that came with ben like how do you make this rat become almost as big as an antagonist as the boss yeah and like the funny thing is like i felt bad for ben because oh, like, I didn't. I thought Ben. I knew they were setting up Ben to be the antagonist throughout it. Yeah, like I mean, I just felt bad for him because, like, you know, Ben just kind of shows up after Socrates does, and uh, he Willard just sees him and goes, "Oh, aren't you a big boy?" And like after that, he just treats Ben poorly, and I think that's kind of why Ben kind of goes rogue and does his own thing because he just well, yeah, Willard poorly. definitely favors Socrates. Yeah, over Ben, um, and I just felt so bad for Ben because, like, the way he was just treated, like until he became the antagonist. Well, I see. I kind of knew in that scene where he was like, "Aren't you big?" I'm like, "This rat's gonna be fucking trouble," because he's gonna be like the second in command. And I, like, I, I had a different view than you did. I didn't really feel bad for Ben. I, I got that they were trying to make us feel bad for Ben, but I was all like, like, oh dear, this rat's gonna yeah, fuck like, shit up. Oh, I knew he was gonna fuck shit up, but I still felt bad. Like this. Is one of those uh villains that you could that you felt for is how i looked at it yeah absolutely and that's and that's cool if you had that like connection right i i did wish he got treated nice so there were some parts where he grabbed ben's tail which i wasn't too down with um yeah, i think that might have been cgi though i'm not i'm, sure. I'm hoping it was um because i don't think that's i'm assuming it would hurt <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know um i don't own rats so i have no idea and swing it by it, but I would never pick up an animal by its tail and swing it. Yeah, because in that scene, he picked it up and threw him down the stairs. Yeah, so, yeah, I would assume that was the CGI. Yeah, I would hope so, or or a puppet or something that yeah. was you know fake, right? Um, I I did like like the showing of the colonies and them swarming. They did use real rats for a lot of the scenes. Yep. Um, and his slow descent into like fucked up, like his hit the rats kill his mom basically because she hears them in the basement and she goes down and she gets killed. They have the funeral. Um, meanwhile, you know he he's managed to get back at his boss by having the tires destroyed by the by the rats. So training the rats with the tires and dropping which them once off. again. I, I guess I'm on Team Ben's side because I got to bring up this because like Socrates is the leader, the like, but I, Ben's like the general, and uh, I just yeah. love how. He's just like, Ben, you're not going to fit through that. You're too big. And Ben's just like, want to bet, motherfucker? Just chews a hole through the garage yeah. door and just goes in there and does damage. I'm like, I guess I'm kind of team Ben in that way. <laughs> yes, you are definitely team Ben. Um, 
I do enjoy the, how he's walking away with the rats, and then he puts the dog in the rat in the in the suitcase, uh, the little pomeranian. Yes, and that, and that pomeranian just starts freaking out because it's getting bit. Oh my god! I was like, please don't eat the please please don't kill the dog. Please don't kill the dog. But again, that was me in the next scene. Um, he didn't. So I was really glad that that didn't happen. Um, but that was my reaction with the uh, cat. Cat. I know. As re- the cat and the cat does get killed. And it's um, the music. Oh, like I actually teared up during that because of the music. It was that fucking music they played. I know, and you feel really bad for the cat. And like the cat didn't do anything. Yeah, the cat was just trying to stay away from the rats, and the rats the cat were just like dumped in there. I was like, what the fuck? Like. <laughs> Yeah, and this is like, it's almost like this sad, like, happy music playing in the background, and it's just like pulling on my heart. And what a well done cat, though, that jumps up and turns on the TV. Um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, obviously, the cat obviously didn't die. Like, Scott, I know this. And, but I knew it was coming. I turned off the music and I just watched subtitles. Ah, see, I I knew it was coming. I'm like, this cat's not going to survive. Volume down. Yeah, I I didn't turn the volume down, yeah. but like I I knew it was coming, but that just that music is what got me. I'm like, <laughs> this is I so know. sad. It had all the feels. Um, and just yeah, every every animal in this I felt for. Like I felt for real. Everything was sad. This movie is a fucking downer. I will be straight. Yeah. This movie is a downer. That even though he does get his revenge for Socrates being murdered by his boss. And he opens the elevator and all the rats come flooding out into his boss's, you know, office. And then he gets, the boss gets killed in the elevator and he says goodbye to Ben. And then later on back at the house, the the, the kind of the love interest shows up and they're going to go get something to eat. And then Ben comes back and Ben's pissed and has it out with Willard. And I I agree with you. The acting with Christian Glover is just out of this fucking world. Like it has to basically act with a rat. He basically has a dialogue with Rat, with him being the only one that can talk. Yeah, and, and that's this, like pretty fucking amazing. And I was gonna say, like, in the emotions, like, like I say, like this movie built up. Like, I need to still watch the original Willard. I want to see mm-hmm. like how well that one is done. But like, I've always heard that the remake was better. But um, I I just love how they build this character between just a tiny little white rat, a giant big black rat, and Willard himself. And like, well, and there's a lot of symbolism there, right? Too. Yeah. So it's it's a really good film, but fuck, is it depressing? Like it's yeah. Uh, oh, it's I, not I, something I could watch multiple times because it's just such a fucking downer. <laughs> yeah, and I, I oh, and once again, this movie made me tear up a couple times because then the death of Socrates, the death of Socrates, Willard basically losing any happiness, her turning her back on him, and him, you know, her her his, the one friend he had. Like, hit that boss to serve to fucking die. He was a yeah. shithead. Um, fucked over Willard's family from the beginning. I just, and then Willard ends up in a mental institution and has a new Socrates. Um, yep. I, I, Christian Glover, props to his role. He made a rat one of the strongest antagonists I've ever seen. It was yes. Christian Glover's reaction to Ben that sold Ben as an antagonist. And yeah, I absolutely. and I give him nothing but respect for that. But I will probably not watch this film again unless it's for a review because it's just so fucking depressing. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I want to watch the original just so I can see the differences if there is any. You watch it and tell me because okay. I don't need to watch the original. I've seen um, this one and I'm good. The one I will recommend though that you should watch is Ben. I want I you to watch that. Watch ben. it's I, I don't know ne- if I can take it anymore. Well, Ben's not a sad movie. It's not like depressing like Willard is. This one, it just, I think that, I'm thinking that's maybe why I'm team Ben is because I watched Ben and just like, it, Ben is almost like uh, Socrates in Willard okay. to this little boy. Well, I will take your, your opinion on it, but I strongly recommend this movie if you have not watched it and you like rats, don't like rats, fear of rats, don't have a fear of rats, I think you'll enjoy this film. Yes. And I think Christian Glover is to thank for that. He he nails this role. I, I think he should get a lot of credit for how he performed here. Absolutely. Because, yeah, this movie just blew me away with how good it was. I, I was not expecting it to be... To, I was not expecting to like it as much as I did. No, and I agree with you. I, yeah. I loved it. And 
I'll revisit it at some point, but at the same time, I already know I'm just a big blubbering baby and I'll be tearing up at the same scenes over again. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's our end of pets and horror. Uh, we covered some some exotic pets here today um, and how they were presented in these films and very much enjoyed it. And then into our out of the dark segment, we were, we were struggling what we wanted to talk about. And we're not going to have an extremely long conversation on this, but we wanted to talk about... Um, separating the person from the product or from the media source so what i guess what i'm trying to get to is we've all heard at this point about marilyn manson yep. um and the you know allegations of abuse that have been brought against him by his ex-fiance um his ex-girlfriend um his manager whatever people are coming out to say now in all defense to marilyn manson i don't think marilyn manson ever presented himself as someone that wasn't into the stuff that these women are talking about nope i'll um, say like i'm pretty mean, sure he said that he did engage in those behaviors now that's not making it right well, i'm just stating that i i believe he was open about it yeah i'll say i think he was open about it in one of his biographies that he wrote okay or his autobiography that he wrote now here's the thing there's one thing to engage in those behaviors there's another thing to get consent yes and i think where we really begin to question the lines of stuff like this is people will sometimes well she said yes but why did she say yes did she feel threatened to say yes because perhaps if i was in a situation where i'm with someone that's much more famous than me and they're asking me to do things and i don't really want to i say yes because i'm afraid that's not real consent no i get that people out there want that to be but it's actually not so you know and obviously there needs to be a formal investigation into this um but allegations in some cases do change the way that the public perceives you. So Creep Show has decided, or Creep is it Creep Show? Yep. Has decided that they will not be using his segment. And Scott and I wanted to give our thoughts on this. Um, and, and in general of what happens when anybody, um, though I think it should be equal for men and women, and sometimes it is not. Um, I think women should be held to the same accountabilities if they've lied or committed any kind of assault against a man or another woman. Yeah, like Amber Heard somehow was not, which is- I think, of... and that I think is fucking bullshit. Yeah. I really do. I, I don't think that's right at all. I don't think it's okay for a woman to lie about sexual harassment from a man. I don't think it's okay for a woman to hit a man. I don't think it's okay for a woman to emotionally abuse a man. I don't think it's okay to, for them to force them to do things that they're not comfortable with, whatever that may be. Um, now, unfortunately, there is, you know, more men that do it than women, but it doesn't mean that yep. women shouldn't be held to a same accountability. Exactly. So Scott and I just wanted to share our thoughts on, you know, is, does this make sense? What do we think? So what do you think, Scott? What do you think of the decision here? Well, I was going to, uh, <clears throat> I was going to say on Shudder and AMC's part, since this is a creep show is their property, they're doing what I think is the right choice by canceling this segment not because i'm saying he's guilty or anything like that i'm saying this because all this is going to do is bring bad press right now and what a corporation or an entity like that will do will want to cut out that source that is causing that bad press they do not want to deal with that and whether you know the situation is true or not maybe his episode will be released later who knows We'll have to wait and see what happens with the allegations. And like, honestly, I personally think he is guilty, but that's just me. Um, but I do. Yeah, I think the way they are handling this is appropriate in the way they're doing it. And even his record label has stopped uh, promoting his new album and cut ties with him. And yeah, that's what happens. Like if you are someone in power and in this famous and these types of allegations, whether they're abuse or murder or any type of like thing that could be a felony any types or... of non-consensual behavior is what we're yes. talking about right is and true consent not consent that is given out of fear and i want to make that very clear and power there is a difference between someone consenting because they're afraid like it would be like <laughs> women that give in to being raped over murdered they're not consenting to the rape they're just doing that to survive the situation right. with men who are in jail that have a choice of being raped or murdered. I don't yeah. think they're consenting to the gangbang that's being suffered on them. I think they're just no. trying to survive. And I think that's the biggest thing too, is, is that we need to look at consent and, and, you know, whether he was into this behavior or not, that's fine. As long as the other party was of their own free will and consenting without the fear of harm that if they didn't. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like, 
this is something that, yeah, I don't blame Shudder or anybody for removing any ties with him for right now. Like, this is just something that has to be done as a company. If you're going to, like, if you're a brand name, you got to protect, you got to protect your brand. You know, and I, and I think absolutely there's, there's guilty until proven innocent, but that's a charge. You as a media person, anyone that chooses to take that step into media chooses to know that their personal life is going to be on display, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, And if you engage in whatever behaviors, you need to know that they're going to be exposed and other people can choose to react to them how they want to. And I think that's what we forget here. So let's say Scott and I had a guest on one of our episodes, okay? And later on, you know, the guest does really well. That's so great. We invite them back a second time. And it comes out, and this could be man or woman, that they were involved in some sort of harassment. Yeah. Um, Maybe they stalked somebody. Maybe they hurt somebody. Maybe they frauded somebody. And it's being investigated. I probably would not bring them on the show. No. Um, Or if our show had been uh, recorded already and we hadn't released it, we probably wouldn't release it. We probably wouldn't. Because... And this has nothing to do with whether they have a penis or a vagina. This has nothing to do with whether they identify as a woman or a man to me. This simply comes down to if someone has engaged in a behavior or has been accused of engaged in a behavior and multiple people have of whether, and to me, if that behavior is extreme enough that I am uncomfortable with it, I am going to wait before I release something with me connected to that individual personally. That is what I am going to do. It doesn't mean I'm going to run around and say that person's guilty and that I'm going to make all these rumors up. I'm just going to choose not to release something. And that's all Shudder is dealing here. People yeah. translate this into Shudder thinks he's guilty. No, Shudder is choosing not to release something because they don't want to be associated with this until it's resolved. Yep, exactly. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's not like they're denying him money. They've already paid him for his role because obviously that's how, how it happens. Yep. Actors get paid for their role. And then the rights are just distributors. Uh, the distributor gets the rights to everything that's aired and played. So yeah, what they did is they already paid him. So whether that comes out or not is no concern to his now because mm-hmm. he already did his job. And like, yeah, so this is just Shutter's decision to just kind of back away from the situation and let things settle down before, you know, going forward. They may well, never- Or to release- get a clear, condition, like a clear yeah. situation here. If he is innocent and he didn't do these things, then they can choose to do it. Maybe they still won't release it. Yeah, I'll say they may never they may never release it ever. And and there could be a variety of reasons. People just decide that well, Shutter's not releasing it, so that means they think he's guilty. Yeah. And I will stand by that if I and Scott were in a situation where we had someone on our podcast, and I know Scott feels the same way I do, yeah. and something came out about that individual, and it would not matter their sex, <laughs> let's make that clear, or how they identified. Um, we wouldn't release the episode until we both felt confident that we were okay with being seen as socializing and supporting that individual's choices. And I, I have no problem admitting that. And if that, I, and I, and I think that's exactly what's going on here. So this whole, did he do it? Did he not do it? It's going to be brought out in time. And I think when you have multiple claims, it's very likely yeah, yes, cause... people do lie. Yes. But I think we need to look at a lot of factors here and hopefully they will in making the decision on whether he engaged in his behaviors or not. Absolutely. Cause yeah, like I, I have heard it multiple times on social media. Oh, it's the cancel culture. Oh, it's the cancel culture. No, it's not cancel culture. It is doing what is, what is right for the company, what is right for their brand and what is right to support any individual that is, a, that is calling for these abuse allegations. It's, mm-hmm. it's their decision, not ours. I hate that term cancel culture. Cause it is just getting thrown around for every damn thing now and no one knows the reasoning for it and no one knows the true definition of it they're just saying it because it's a new hip word to use and it's fucking stupid well and here's the thing and i was having this conversation with my my friend ann and you know there's always that you know well women shouldn't have women just don't walk at night you just don't go here after night you don't dress like this you don't dress like that how about we teach everyone men and women that you don't sexually assault somebody. Yes. And it doesn't matter what your gender what your gender is, whether it is male or female. You don't do things to people unless you have their consent to do it. This is very simple. Yeah. And I think that 
when people get upset about cancel culture, they're upset about something that they've done. And, you know, I used to harass one of my good friends. I used to grab his chest all the time and I would squeeze it. He was a bigger dude. We were younger. And I thought it was funny. He didn't like it. I didn't stop. One day he grabbed me back and he did the same thing to my chest. And I was shocked because double standard, I'm a chick. That's okay if I do it to you. And, you know, I was much younger than obviously. And I apologize to him. And I still bring that up with people because that was my talk. I was harassing him. Yeah. I was harassing him. And we have all harassed somebody at some point. We need to get off our fucking high horses and realize that we've all engaged in some form of harassment at some time. Yep. And I was like, fuck, I shouldn't be doing that. My bad. And it was a learning lesson for me. And I needed him to do that to me to learn. Now, would I advocate that other men do that to someone? Of course not. Would I advocate women do that to someone? Of course not. But I'm giving an example of where I was guilty of something. And I think when people get up and down about cancel culture, they're afraid to look at themselves and go, shit, maybe I've done something that I shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> and we all have, guys. We all have. We've all either harassed someone verbally, physically, you know, perhaps done something with somebody sexually that they didn't want. They didn't tell us. It happens. So get off your fucking like high horse and worrying about it. And let's just see what happens with Marilyn Manson. And if he's not on Shudder, that's Shudder's choice. And yep. we can wait to see what occurs. And this isn't Shudder saying he's guilty or innocent. It's just them choosing to disassociate until the situation's dealt with. Exactly. And also, if, you know, just because he's getting removed from his record label and Shudder, does not mean that, you know, if you, you know, are unsure on how you feel about it, doesn't mean it's going to stop you from watching anything he's been in before. No, it's or not going to stop you from music. listening to his music. You do what you want to do. Like, you know, that no one's going to judge you. If they're judging you, that's they're getting too personal anyways. Like, this is your choice. You know, if someone doesn't want to listen to him because of all this after that, that's their choice as well. It's just yep. how like, this is just, you know, each person's going to react differently to this situation. They always do. And, you know, no one is correct and no one is wrong. I agree with you, Scott. And I think the biggest thing is if he does come out that he sexually harassed women and that comes out, you know, he maybe admits it and all this, then it's true, guys. If you still want to listen to fucking beautiful people, that's fine. It's true. I have a love-hate thing with R. Kelly, for example. I love R. Yeah. Kelly's music. Love it. Love it. He's a piece of shit. Like, he is a straight-out piece of shit. And every time R. Kelly comes up in my Spotify, I'm like, fuck. God damn it, I love this song. But fuck, he's such a piece of shit. Yep. And I struggle with it all the time. And I wish I was one of those people that could be like, nope, I cut him off. This is what he did. I'm not. I'm not because I like the music. And maybe that's my own moral ground that I need to negotiate through and, and waddle through. But I think too much in horror, you know, we we get upset when our, you know, our our idols get, you know, blasted. And I think we just need to understand that networks are allowed to do whatever they want <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just move on so yeah so scott and i i guess clearly don't really know whether we can separate the person from the art um yep like usually like well for you and i we definitely separate the art from the artist because like with you with our kelly like i like roman well, and, I like, and i like Je uh, jeepers creepers yeah i'll say I, like i was just gonna say jeepers creepers and uh Roman Polanski's yeah. films like Rosemary's Baby and stuff like that. I still love those films, but yeah, like you just got to kind of, if you can do it, you can separate the artists from the artist. Then yeah, you can still enjoy what they've yeah. done without, you know, tying it back to them somehow. Yeah, it's an interesting, and it's an interesting debate to have on Facebook right now. But I'll be honest, I do prefer that over listening about COVID-19 for the 18th billion time or whether people should get vaccinated or not. So at least it's something different. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Like at least it's something different that we can that we can talk about and that we can I don't know explore. But it'll be interesting to see where this goes with Shutter and other choices. And and I am glad to see networks speaking out even during the Black Lives Matter new movement. And I know people will be like, oh, it's superficial. The big corporations they don't care. Yeah, I get all that. Okay. The point is that it looks good in the public eye. Yep. And the more people that are talking about it, the better off we're going to be. So exactly. Like I look into it to the level that it deserves to be looked into um but yeah so that's our thoughts um our next episode i don't know do we decide what we're doing for our next episode we're gonna have some guests on um we're gonna be working on that yep i uh, trying to remember i don't know if we had a specific topic like in mind for our very next episode i think we had like a 
a lineup of ideas, but we didn't have like which one we were going to do next. Yeah, either way, it's going to be awesome. Just to yeah. really see. Um, in other news, I was on the Psychosymmetric podcast that has been released. Um, please listen. I talk <laughs> about higher learning and all my other political opinions in case you're really curious to what I think about life. Um, yes, p- please give that episode a listen because <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> Two of the most intelligent people I know, just having it back and forth, just talking about the politics and the education systems and everything in between and the social health care. It's just a very, very fascinated, well-spoken listen. Just give it a listen because, uh, yeah, like everything that both Heather and Darren have said, I am 100% behind everything that I agree with them all the way through it. I'm just not smart enough to word it as intellectually as these two do. That's not true. You're very smart. You just, you write things very well. Yeah. Speaking, I'm just kind of blah, blah, blah. You're just hoping for the best every time. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we'll, we'll be back next time with a new topic. We have a list of topics, by the way, everyone. We just don't make, well, sometimes we make them up, but we have a list now. We just haven't decided what we want to do next because we've been trying to manage all the guest spots. We still have to reach out to our guest spot people, but this will be a year of guest spots on Friday Nightmares. So we're very excited. Yes, we are definitely going to have some fun ones planned and hopefully everything goes through and we can have a blast with all this stuff because yeah we got some fun ideas absolutely good times are coming ahead so until then um scotty do you want to send us out yes until next time unpleasant dreams